now, The Adventures of Superman. It is midnight in Metropolis. The city's noisy pulse is stilled. Darkness like a thick blanket covers its sleeping millions. On Morton Street, alive by day with the clatter of neighborhood crowds, all is silent save for the distant tolling of the clock in the insurance building tower. The muffled, hollow footsteps of two shrouded figures move cautiously along the row of darkened storefronts, keeping close in their shadows. They pass the community market, its green shades drawn. They pass Miller's Bakery and Spinelli's Shoe Repair Shop and Clausen Brothers' Butchers. Then suddenly, at a whispered command from one, they stop, crouched and alert in the thick shadows. There is a light in the corner drugstore. I thought you said he closes before midnight. Yeah, yeah, he does. I cased the joint all week. You cased the joint? I ought to sock you one. Honest, honest, I did. How can I help it if he ain't closed up yet? Maybe he's got a customer. Yeah, maybe you ain't gonna live long enough to... Hey, get back. What's the matter? Someone's coming out of the store. You see? He told you he had a customer. You told me. Yeah, yeah, I said Shut up. Have... But... Shut up. Here he comes. Who? Who do you suppose? Oh, oh yeah. Hey, it's him. He's locking the door. Keep back. He's getting this car, see? Just like I told you. You told me. Get ready. Yeah, sure. Sure, I'm ready. You got the bottle? The what? The bottle, you dummy, the bottle. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, yeah, I got it. Hey, what's in it? What do you think? Huh? Hey, there he goes. He's driving away. Come on. Wait, wait a minute. What for? Wait till he gets out of sight, you dope. Coast is clear. Let's go. You know what to do now? Yeah, yeah, sure I know. Listen, you mess this up and I'll break oh, it. Oh, won't I? Don't worry. Better not. Okay, here we are. What are you waiting for? I'm just looking at all that blue gauze and the wind advertising perfume. Ain't that gonna boing pretty, huh? Yeah. Hey, come on, throw that thing, will you? Okay. Here goes. Holy cow. Hurry up, you dope. Sprinkle that stuff around. Yeah, I am. Wait a minute, will you? All right, that's enough. Get back. I'm going to toss a match in there. <clears throat> Creepers. Okay. That'll learn them. Come on, let's go. Mr. Ken and Mr. White, what you saw on Morton Street last night. Gosh, uh, are you sure it's okay, Jim? Well, you don't think I would have brought you down here if I didn't think it was okay, do you? Yeah, I know, but... Well, gosh, if they ever find out that... If who finds out? What's this all about, Olson? Who is this kid? Well, His I... name is Danny O'Neill, Chief. He's a friend of Jimmy's and he's a newsboy. Oh. Look, Danny... Yes, sir? You'd like to tell us something about the Morton Street fire, wouldn't you? How did you know? Well, Jim said you saw something on Morton Street last night, and since that's where the fire started, I just sort of put two and two together. Danny saw plenty. He saw the guys who started the fire. What? Kent, tell Bob to hold the presses. Now, wait hold a minute. Hold up the makeup roll. Rip out the front page. Don't sit there gaping at me. There was oh, a scoop geez. here. Hand me a scoop. Well, Jim, you said they wouldn't put it in the paper. You promised. Kent, in the name of heaven, will you? Just a minute, Chief. I promised Danny we wouldn't print anything he told us, Mr. White. You promised Danny. And who are you? Well... I'm running this paper, and I'll decide what to print and what not to print. <laughs> now see what you've done, yelling at the top of your lungs. See what I've done. Oh, don't cry, Danny. It'll be all right. Oh, Kent, for the last time, will you get those presses stopped? No, or... I won't. What? Now look, Chief. You know as well as anyone does that off-the-record statements made to a reporter are held in confidence. But, but he's only a kid. I don't care if he's a kid or a king or a prince or a pauper. He has as much right to have his confidences respected as anyone. Well, okay, you win. Hey, you see, Danny, everything's all right. It's not going to be printed. Now you can tell him. You better tell him, Jim. I'm too... Oh, okay, Danny. Here, here's a clean handkerchief. Blow your nose. Huh? Thanks. Now, you just sit back and relax. I'll tell Mr. Ken and Mr. White what you saw. Oh, if I get anything wrong, you correct me, huh? All right. Go ahead, Jim. Well, last night, Danny's mother got sick and she needed some medicine. Uh-huh. It was around midnight, and although Danny wasn't sure the drugstore would be open, he got dressed and went down. It was closed. 
But as he came around the corner, he saw two guys standing in front of the Morton Street window of the store. One of them had a brick in his hand, and the other one had a bottle. What kind of a bottle? I'll come to that. Well, anyway, suddenly the guy with the brick tossed it through the store window. The guy with the bottle ran up to the window and sprinkled some stuff inside. Gasoline. Then the guy who threw the brick lit a match and set fire to it. Then they ran. Good Godfrey. And you mean to tell me we can't print that? Wait a minute, Chief. There's more. Go on, Jim. Oh, the first thing Danny thought of was to turn in a fire alarm. So he ran across the street to a box and rang the alarm. And then he got frightened. Why, Danny? You tell him, Jim. Well, he... He got frightened because he thought he recognized the guy who threw the brick and set the stuff in the window on fire. Well, who was he? Danny thinks it was a guy named Muggs. A big, tough kid who quit school last year and spends all his time hanging around a pool room. Well, I don't understand. Why did that frighten you, Danny? You know why, Jim. Sure. Danny was frightened because when he came around the corner, he was right under a street lamp. And just as he saw Muggs and recognized him, he sure Muggs saw him. Uh-huh. That's why he was afraid to go to the police. That's why he came to me. Muggs will kill me if he finds out I snitched. Over my dead body, he will. Kent, you get Henderson on the phone. Tell him to send a squad of cops into that neighborhood immediately. I want that little hoodlum, that Muggs character, picked up tonight. He, he's not there. Well, not where, Danny? He went away. What? I heard the other tough kids talking about how Muggs went away and, and wouldn't be back till tomorrow. Uh, hiding out like a big-time gangster. Well, tomorrow's time enough. Uh, what's Muggs' last name, Danny? I don't know. That's the only name they call him. You wouldn't have any idea why he and the other boys started that fire in the drugstore, would you? No. I don't know why they did it. Well, what's the difference why they did it? They did it? Well, uh, it may make a lot of difference. Okay, Danny, I think you told us all we need to know. And look, son, don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to you. That Muggs is awful tough. Well, we can be tough, too. Jim. Yeah? Danny's had a pretty tough day. Suppose you take him home in a cab, huh? Oh, sure. And don't go to school tomorrow, Danny. Jim and I'll pick you up about, oh, ten in the morning. Is that all right? Yeah, I guess so. Good boy. Come on, Danny. We're going home in style. Are we home already? A sure thing. That's where you live, isn't it? Yeah. I'll see you in the morning, Danny. Okay, Jim. So long. So long. Wait a minute, kid. Huh? You Danny O'Neill? Yeah. Okay, skinny. Let him have it. Hey, come on, let's go. Oh, yeah. We'll be back in a moment for the exciting climax of today's episode. You know, gang, you're always meeting up with Popeye and Maggie and Jigs and the Little King and different funny papers. But here's a way you can get all those comic strip characters, and more too, together at one time. And that's by collecting that exciting new second series of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pet. And what fun it is to trade duplicates with your friends and add a new button to your collection. Mighty satisfactory, too, to wear all your pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap right out where all your pals can see how many you've collected. Because these new second series buttons are real beauties printed in full comic strip colors on a gleaming white enameled button that really shows up. Now, don't forget that there are 18 different comic strip characters in this new second series, and you'll want to collect them all. You can, too. Sure, easy as ABC. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. Fact is, you can't buy these pep comic buttons anywhere. You get them just by asking Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pep. Yes, Pep is the prize package where you find new comic buttons to add to your collection. That's P-E-P, Pep. The Sunshine Cereal, made by Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. And now, back to our story. It is 8.30 that same evening. Clark Kent, returning to his apartment after having had dinner with Perry White, enters just as the phone rings. Hello. Mr. Kent, this is Beanie at the office. Oh, yes, Beanie. Gosh, I've been trying to get you for the last half hour. Why, what's the trouble? It's it's about Jim, Mr. Kent. Jim? What about him? He was taken to the Metropolis Hospital. What was that? They 
I said, Jim was taken to the Metropolis Hospital and he wants you to get down there as fast as you can. Struck as though by a bolt of lightning, the pit of his stomach suddenly empty and hollow. Clark Kent slams the phone receiver down and heads for the door. On Rudy changes his mind, turns and quickly strips off his business suit, revealing himself in the blue costume and red cape of Superman. I can get there a lot faster this way. Up with the window. Out. And away! Jim, what happened? What's wrong? Gosh, Mr. Ken, I thought you'd never get here. Oh, Beanie had some trouble locating me. What's it all about? From the way Beanie talked, I was sure you were in an accident. Oh, no, no, it's not me. It, it's Danny. Danny O'Neill. What about him? All I know is he's in bad shape. He, he's on the danger list. Danger list? What happened to him? Well, you remember when we were in the office and you said to take Danny home in a taxi? Yes. Well, that's what I did. I dropped him right at his door, and then I thought I'd be a sport, so I took the taxi home. Yes, go on. Well, I was washing up for dinner when the telephone rang. It was Father Sheehan. You know, the priest at St. Mary's. Well, he's the young priest, isn't he? Yeah. He said Danny was in the hospital, badly hurt, and that he kept asking for me, and could I come right over? Oh, Beanie got it all wrong. He said you were taken to the hospital. Well, anyway, what happened to Danny? I don't know. Father Sheehan and the doctor have been with him ever since I got here. Oh? The doctor said he let me know the minute... Oh, here he comes now. You can go up now if you wish, young man. Take the elevator to the fifth floor. Father Sheehan is waiting for you outside the room. Thank you, doctor. Come on, Mr. Kent. What happened to the boy, Father? From all indications, he was cruelly beaten in the hallway of his house. What? One of the tenants found him unconscious. Oh, golly. He's in pretty bad shape. Doctors are afraid he may have a brain concussion. Oh, no. That's what it looks like. Well, we'll go in now. But we can only stay a minute or two. And he mustn't be excited. Remember that, Jim. Huh? Oh, yeah, okay. Danny. Danny, here's Jim. Jim and Mr. Kent. Hello, Danny. Oh. Hi, Jim. Hi, Mr. Kent. Hi, Danny. What what happened, Danny? They they were waiting for me in the hall. I, I didn't even get a chance to fight back. Who was it, Danny? Muggs. Muggs and another kid. A skinny kid. They were laying for me. Okay, that's all we need to know. Look, Jim. What, Danny? My mother, Jim. I'm worried about my mother. She's all alone now, and those guys maybe will try to do something to her. Danny. Yes, Father? You trust me, don't you? Sure. Sure I do. Then don't worry about your mother. I promise you no harm will come to her, and she won't be alone either. I'll arrange for someone to live with her until you're well enough to go. The important thing is for you to get well. Well, quickly. I think you'd all better leave now. He needs rest. Yes, of course, Doctor. I'll see you in the morning, Danny. Yeah, so will I. Thanks, Father. Thanks, Jim. Bye, Danny. Bye, Mr. Kent. Doctor, you have my phone number and guess, Father, I have. Gosh, I never saw anybody's face so white. He's a sick boy, Jim. A very sick boy. Just wait till I get my hands on that mugs. Just wait. Easy, Jim. They try to kill him. They try to kill him to keep him quiet. Well, I'm afraid I don't quite understand what this is all about. Do you know, Kent? Yes, Father, I do. It seems that Danny was an accidental eyewitness to the starting of the Morton Street fire last night. He was? Uh-huh. And he recognized the boy who hurled the brick through the window of Hoffman's drugstore. He told Jim about it, and Jim brought him to the Daily Planet, where he repeated the story for Mr. White and myself. He was a little frightened because he thought the boy had seen him, too, and well, he was afraid he might get into trouble. Oh, he was right, he did. And this boy, the boy Denny saw, is he the same one? Yeah, the one who beat him up. His name is Muggs. And he started the Morton Street fire? He and another kid. The boy Denny identified as Muggs broke the window of the drugstore. The other lad sprinkled gasoline over a, a, a gauze perfume display, and Muggs set fire to it. I see. Why they did it hasn't yet been explained. Unless it was just vandalism. No, Kent. No, there's more to it than that. A lot more. Setting fire to Dave Hoffman's store is just the beginning. Beginning of what? Well, listen. About a month ago, Mr. Walters, principal of the public school, asked me to attend a meeting in his office. Uh -huh. There were six of us present. Three members of the clergy, Harry Stone, Rabbi of the Morton Street Temple, Sam Leeds of the First Congregational Church, and myself. 
And three laymen. George Murphy, the retired police inspector, and Dave Hoffman, the druggist, and Mr. Walters. Well, what was the purpose of the meeting? Well, we met to discuss two things. How we could get the youngsters of this crowded neighborhood off the streets. And more important, how we could show them how to get along with one another. No matter what their race or religion. Well, I can't think of anything better you could have done. Well, to make a long story short, we planned to build a clubhouse and playground for the neighborhood kids. Mm-hmm. We were going to call it Unity House, and its doors were going to be open to youngsters of all races and all creeds. And then something happened? It sure did, Jim. The moment our plan was announced in the papers, all six of us received threatening letters telling us to lay off or else. Did you turn them over to the police? Yes, but there was no chance of tracing them. Evidently, last night, the rats decided to come out of their holes. I'm sure it was they who set fire to Dave Hoffman's store. You mean those kids, Muggs and the other one, don't want you to build a clubhouse? Oh, no, Jim. Father Sheehan means there's someone behind all this. Someone who's telling Muggs and his gang what to do. Perhaps even an organization. That's right, Ken. And if Danny doesn't pull through, it'll mean they're not even stopping at murder. But, but why are they doing it? What's the idea? The idea is to prevent us from getting the youngsters of this neighborhood together. To prevent us from trying to teach them that all of us were created equal. That we have equal rights and that those rights should be respected. Oh, why don't we go out and grab Muggs and get him to tell us who's behind this? It's not that easy, Jim. Chances are he won't talk. Then have him clapped into jail for setting fire to Mr. Hoffman's store and beating Danny up. But it isn't Muggs we're after. It's someone higher up. You agree, don't you, Father? No question about it, Kent. This has all the earmarks of an organized attempt to stir up trouble between people of different races and religions. Why, it's the Nazi method. Well, we licked the Nazis, so I guess we can lick this. Once we locate the people behind it. Got any ideas? Yes. Yes, but I'll have to have a talk with Inspector Henderson first to see whether he'll play ball with us. And I want to talk with you. To me? Uh Uh-huh. Suppose we all get out of the main floor waiting room. Ken, I think perhaps I'd better stay up here. Huh? The way things are, I... I may be needed suddenly. Oh, yes, of course, I understand. But count me in on anything you plan to do. We certainly will, Father. As soon as I'm through with Jim, I'm going over to police headquarters. If Henderson will cooperate... I'm sure we can get those rats you mentioned to walk into a trap. We'll return in just a moment for the climax of today's episode. Say, gang, here's something that'll hand you a laugh. It's that Lord Plushbottom button, one of the new second series of comic buttons that now come in packages of Kellogg's Pep. Talk about comical. Why, you'll start to chuckle the minute you see his old-fashioned eyeglasses and walrus-like mustache and high silk hat. And he has the silliest expression on his face. Yes, sir, Lord Plushbottom is sure on the beam when it comes to fun. And all the rest of those 18 new second series comic buttons, too. Maggie and Jigs and Olive Oil and Popeye and Andy Gump, Hans and Fritz and the Little King, Uncle Willie, Emmy, Rip, Winkle, Pop Jinx, and Superman, of course. Well, it's no end of fun adding to your collection and swapping duplicates with your pals and wearing your buttons on your jacket or dress or cap. And you know, the best part is, it's so easy to get these swell new comic buttons. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to keep you supplied with lots of Kellogg's Pep and look for your prize in every package. Yes, sir, there's a comic button for you every time you open a package of P-E-P Pep. The Sunshine Cereal, made by Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. And now, back to the adventures of Superman. In the main floor waiting room of the Metropolis Hospital, Clark Kent, his voice low and confidential, outlines his plan to Jimmy Olsen. The point is this, Jim... Under ordinary circumstances, the police would arrest Muggs and the boy who worked with him. However, that would warn whoever's behind Muggs. Put them on guard. Yeah, but what are you going to do? Let him go? Well, for the time being. I'll explain the situation to Henderson. I'm sure he'll give me the go-ahead. Go-ahead for what? For the plan I have in mind. Oh. It's dangerous and it may take time, but... It's the only way I can see to get to the bottom of this. Let's see, it's 8.30 now... I'll call Lois and the chief from headquarters and have them meet me at the office to talk this over. You'd better get something to eat and then go back to the office and wait for me. I I thought maybe I'd hang around here with Father Sheehan. You won't need me. Are you kidding? We need you more than we need anyone. Well, why? My whole plan revolves about you, Jim. Well, about me? Yes. I might as well tell you now, Jim, before we get into it, that it may mean risking your life. 
Well, I must have. I thought you were never coming. I'm sorry I'm late, but I couldn't help you. All right, all right. Never mind the excuses. What's this all about, Kent? Well, mind if I catch my breath, Chief? Well, catch something else. If this isn't important, I had a day tonight, but Jimmy said that you... It's important, Lois. Very important. Last night, as you know, seven stores on Morton Street were burned down. The fire was started by two boys, one of whom has been identified. Where did that information come from? A young friend of Jimmy's, a boy named Danny O'Neill, who happened to see the two kids break the window of Dave Hoffman's drugstore and start the fire. He recognized one of them, a kid known as Muggs. Why didn't he go to the police? Wait a minute, Lois. Danny was afraid to go to the police because, as he said, Muggs was a tough kid, and, well, if he found out Danny had snitched, he'd beat him up. Good heavens! When Danny got home this evening, Muggs and another boy were waiting for him in the hallway of his tenement house. They beat him up so badly that he's now in the Metropolis Hospital, hovering between life and death. Kent, you're not serious. Dead serious, Chief. You mean to tell me that that you haven't heard anything yet? Jimmy and I were at the hospital. It was about eight, wasn't it, Jim? Yeah, just about. Did you see the boy? Just for a moment or two. But we met his priest, Father Sheehan from St. Mary's. Well, I know Father Sheehan. Well, he told us what was behind the Morton Street fire, Danny O'Neill's beating, and whatever may follow. What do you mean, Clark? Well, here it is in a nutshell. About a month ago, Father Sheehan, Rabbi Stone, the Reverend Dr. Leeds of the Congregational Church, and three laymen formed a committee to raise money to to build a gymnasium and playground for youngsters of the neighborhood. Yes? They were going to call it Unity House and open its doors to every youngster in the neighborhood, regardless of race or religion. Mm, darn good idea. And that's what they thought. But the minute it was announced, they all received threatening letters, warning them to give up the idea if they wanted to stay healthy. Who wrote the letters? Oh, they were anonymous, but... They evidently came from hate mongers. Father Sheehan believes it's an organization attempting to stir up trouble between different races and religions. Well, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. What's this all got to do with the Morton Street fire? Yes, you said two boys were responsible for the fire. Well, Muggs and his companion did the actual damage, but there was someone behind them, whoever wrote the threatening letters. And unless we take action, this thing's going to spread. Dave Hoffman was the first, but... He won't be the last. The only action to take is to have the police pick up those two hoodlums. No, Chief. No, no. I had a long talk with Inspector Henderson. If the police arrest Muggs and the other boy, whoever's behind them will run for cover. No, what we've got to do is use Muggs to get to the higher-ups. Henderson has agreed to lay off long enough to test my plan. And what's your plan? Well, it depends on Jim. What? On me? Yes. You see, my idea is to have Jim pose as a tough little hoodlum, scrape up an acquaintance with Muggs, and get into his gang. Are you mad, Are you crazy, Kent? How do you feel about it, Jim? Well, gosh, I don't know. Why, it's ridiculous. Why, Jimmy is just a boy. Why, he won't permit it. No, wait just a minute. To begin with, you both seem to forget that Jim doesn't run copy anymore. He's a reporter and he's grown up. In addition, he'll have plenty of protection. Police protection? No. The protection of Superman. Superman? That's right. What are you trying to pull, Ken? Not a thing, Chief. I've already contacted Superman, and he's more than anxious to help. Well, if that's the case, I why... still don't think Jimmy should be exposed to any danger. Uh, could to I you. say something, please? Sure, go ahead, Jim. Well, I just want to say that even if Superman wasn't going to help us, if Mr. Kent said it was all right for me to do it, I'd do it. Good boy, Jim. Clark, I think you're making a big mistake. Why, if anything happens to Jimmy, you'll be the sorriest hold man it, I ever... Hold saw... it. Hello? Who? Yes, yes, he's here. Just a minute. Uh, for you, Kent. Oh, thanks. Hello. Oh, yes, Father. Father Sheehan, it's about Danny. What was that? Yes. Yes. When did it happen? Oh, he's dead. Danny's dead. I see. Wait a minute, Jimmy. And he's the only one, eh? Jimmy, just a minute. Uh-huh. Jimmy, just... Yes, yes, I understand. Well, I'm not so sure of that, Father. We may be able to do something. Will you stand by at the hospital? I'll be in touch with you. Right. Goodbye. What is it, Clark? It's... It's about Danny. Yes, he's... He's taken a bad turn. Can't they do anything for him? Evidently not. He needs a delicate brain operation, and there's only one surgeon in the country who can do it. Well, what are they waiting for? Get him. I've got a hundred dollars saved up, Mr. King. It's not a matter of money, Jim. It's a matter of time and distance. Surgeon they need lives in Chicago, and unless Danny's operated on within... Well, at the outside, two hours... It's worth the chance. What's worth the chance? Nothing. Nothing. Who are you calling, Kent? Huh? Oh, the, the hospital. Well, you just said just you... Just a minute, please. Hello, Metropolis Hospital? Uh, it's urgent that I speak with Father Sheehan immediately. Well, I think you'll find him somewhere on the fifth floor. That's right. Uh, and tell him Clark Kent is calling, will you? Thank you. Oh, what are you going to do, Mr. Kent? 
save Danny's life if I can, Jim. But, Clark, if the surgeon is in Chicago and the operation must be performed within two Hello? hours, I don't... Father Sheehan? Uh, Clark Kent. Yes, look, can you give me the full name of that Chicago surgeon? Well, get me his address, too, if you can. I'll hold on. Sorry, what were you saying, Lois? I was just saying that if the operation has to be performed within two hours, what's the use of even bothering Excuse you? Excuse me. Hello? Yes? Dr. Ernest C. Henley. Uh-huh. That's C as in Charles? Right. H-E-N-L-E-Y. Uh, you, you, you can't get the address? All right, well, never mind. Now, 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 look, Father. It's 9.15 now. You tell him to get Danny up to the operating room and have him ready. Dr. Henley will be at that hospital before 11. <laughs> Gate, Perry White, Lois Lane, and Jimmy Olsen listen as Clark Kent promises to transport a famous Chicago brain surgeon a thousand miles in less than two hours. We know, of course, that he intends taking action as Superman. But even Superman may fail this time. We'll know more in a moment when we return for the tense and exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. <laughs> You know, gang, there aren't many prizes or such dandy prizes that you can get as easy as those new second series comic buttons that now come in packages of Kellogg's Pet. Why, you don't have to spend a single penny of your allowance, and yet you can have the fun of collecting 18 different buttons, each one with a true-to-life picture of one of your favorite comic strip characters. It's no end of fun to add to your collection every time Mom opens a new package of Pet. Fun to swap duplicates with your pals, too. And mighty exciting to wear all your buttons pinned on your jacket or dress or cap so everybody can see how many you've collected. And did I say these new second series comic buttons are easy to get? Why, you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pet. Then look inside the package for your prize. Get your comic buttons, gang, from P-E-P Pep, the sunshine cereal made by Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. Now, back to the adventures of Superman. With only a brief two hours in which to save young Danny O'Neill's life, Clark Kent and his true identity of Superman has streaked from Metropolis to Chicago, a distance of a thousand miles, in search of Dr. Ernest Henley, a famous brain surgeon. We join him now as once more in the garb of the mild-mannered, bespectacled newspaper reporter. He has tracked him to a medical meeting. We have discovered that a cancerous agent, which we call a milk factor, can be transmitted. We definitely believe... Now, what can I do for you, young man? I understand Dr. Ernest Henley is at this meeting. It's urgent I'm sorry. Dr. Henley opened the meeting and left. That was about 8.30. Oh, Lord. Have you any idea where he went? Why, no. No, no, wait, wait. Uh, He did say something about joining his wife at the theater. They had tickets for a play. What theater, you know? I'm afraid I don't know. How many theaters are there in Chicago? Well, now, let me see. There's uh, Siddick, the Blackstone, Great Northern... Uh, Schubert, the student. Excuse me, can you tell me whether Dr. Ernest C. Henley is in this theater? Henley? Yes, just a moment. Baker, Gray, Brian, Richards. Sorry, if he is, he didn't leave his name at the box office. Dr. Ernest C. Henley. Miller, Levine, Roberts, Dunn, Sorry. Dr. Ernest C. Henley, please. Jeffrey, Carson, Cohen, sorry. Dr. Ernest C. Henley. Sorry. Dr. Ernest C. Henley. Sorry. Dr. Ernest C. Henley. Dr. Ernest C. Henley. Respiration, 22. Pulse, 86. More oxygen. Doctor, isn't there anything we can do for the boy? I'm afraid not, Miss. What about that telephone call Father Sheen got from the newspaper reporter? That Henley would be here by 11? Yes. The man's crazy. I knew it was stupid when we moved the boy up here to the operating room. It's a quarter to 11 now. Henley's a thousand miles away. And this youngster's life is ebbing out each time the clock ticks. I beg your pardon, but can you tell me whether Dr. Henley, Dr. Ernest Henley, is in this theater? Doctors usually leave their names at the box office in case of an emergency call, don't they? Yes. Just a moment. Thank you. Now, let's see. What was that name again? Henley. Ernest C. Henley. 
Bainbridge, Lewis, Cohn, Havemeyer, Henley. Yes, he is here. Oh, thank heaven. What's his seat number? I don't know. What? He didn't leave it with me. He got here after the first uh, curtain went up, and he all he did was stop and tell me his name, Dr. Henley. Well, how can I locate him? Well, you'll have to wait till intermission. I can't wait. I've got to be back in Metropolis in ten minutes. What did you say? I said that I... Well, never mind. I, I'm going in to find Dr. Henley. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. The show's on. That's too bad. Stepping into the theater, Pawn Kent avoids the usher who approaches him, hurries down the aisle, and once he reaches the orchestra pit, turns and faces the audience, raising his hands for attention. Ladies and gentlemen! Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please! Your attention! I'm sorry to have to interrupt the show, but this is a matter of life and death. Is Dr. Ernest Henley in the theater? I'm Dr. Henley. Dr. Henley, would you please meet me in the lobby at once? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On with the show. Hurrying back up the aisle, Clark Kent reaches the lobby just as Dr. Henley, obviously puzzled, emerges from the theater. I'm terribly sorry to have to do this, Dr. Henley, but as I said, it's a matter of life and death. My name is Clark Kent. I'm a reporter on the Metropolis Daily Planet, and I've got to... Oh, just a moment, young man. Uh, not so fast. It's got to be fast, Doctor. A youngster is dying in the Metropolis Hospital, and you're the only one who can possibly save him. Did you say Metropolis? Yes, you've got to be there within half an hour. Young man, are you out of your mind? Metropolis is a thousand miles from Chicago. Well, I've arranged all that. You've arranged what? <laughs> I'm not Superman, you know. No, but I've arranged for Superman to fly you to Metropolis. You... you what? Well, there isn't time to explain now. Are you ready to leave? Well, uh, I don't know. My hat and coat, they're, they're, they're in the checkbook. Well, get your hat and coat and, and wait in the stage door alley outside the theater. Superman will meet you there. But make it fast, please. Yes, yes, but good heavens, this is the most Dazed amazing and confused. thing. confused. The famous brain surgeon, following Clark Kent's instructions, almost automatically re-enters the theater. A minute later, he emerges again, wearing his hat and coat. There on the sidewalk, waiting for him, is the Man of Steel, resplendent in blue costume and red cape. Superman. At your service, Doctor. And I think we'd better get going. Time is growing short. Are you ready? Why, yes. Yes, I suppose so. Good. Under my arm, then. That's it. Now, up, up, and away! Leaping high above the city of Chicago, Superman hovers for a moment in curious flight, takes a bearing from the stars, and heads east, carrying the one man who may have it within his skilled power, not only to save the slowly ebbing life of young Danny O'Neill, but at the same time to strike a blow at whoever is behind the murderous attempt to build up the fires of hatred. Two hours later, as the clock in the Metropolis Bank Tower strikes midnight, we find Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen at the now deserted office of the Daily Planet. Tell me again how Superman brought Dr. Henley from Chicago, Mr. Kent. Well, I've told you once, Jim. I've told you a dozen times. At 10.30, we were in Chicago. At 10.50, Dr. Henley was at the Metropolis Hospital. Oh, who's we? Dr. Henley uh, and Superman. Oh, you said we like you were Superman. Oh, did I? Yeah, that sounds silly, doesn't it? Yeah, kind of. I think we ought to call the hospital again. It's midnight. Well, we can't keep calling every ten minutes, Jeff. Yeah, I know, but it's been an hour since Dr. Henley started operating. I know. It's an awful long time. Well, brain operations are very delicate things. They take lots of time. We've done all we can do, Jim. Everything humanly possible. The rest is in the hands of God. If Danny pulls through, and I'm praying he will, we're going right ahead with our plan to get to whoever's behind all this hate-spreading campaign. Mugs and the other kid aren't important. They're just tools. Someone higher up is using them. And that'll be your job, Jim. To get to the higher up through Muggs and his gang. You think you can handle it? Oh, I don't think. I know. You just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Good boy, Jim. Now, could we call the hospital? All right, all right. Go ahead. Get Miss Williams, the head nurse. I'll speak to you. Okay. Remember, this is the last call tonight. If there's no news, you're going home to bed. Oh, gosh, Mr. Ken, I couldn't sleep. Honest, I couldn't. Now, look, Jim, you've got to be sensible about this. Sitting here worrying isn't going to get there. Oh, Metropolis Hospital? I'd like to speak to Miss Williams, the head nurse. Oh, uh, Mr. Kent's calling. Mr. Kent of the Daily Planet. Uh-huh. Thank you. She'll be right around here. Here. Okay, thanks. Hello, Miss Williams. This is Clark Kent. Well, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I... What was that? Oh, gosh. I see. Yes, yes, I'll hold on. Mr. Kent is... Take it easy, Tim. Dr. Henley has just come out of the operating room. It's all over. All over? You mean Danny? I mean the operation's all over. Miss Williams is finding out the result. Oh, gosh. All we can do now, Jim, is pray. That's what I'm doing. I'm praying as, 
as hard as I can. Lowering his head, Jimmy clasps his hands in his lap, his thin body tight and tense. Meanwhile, an odd scene is taking place in another part of the city. A scene that in a moment will bring this episode to a strange and startling climax. Say, gang, if you should happen to help your mother with the weekend shopping, and if mother should happen to need a new package or two of Kellogg's Pep, don't forget to remind her, because this sunny golden toasted cereal tastes a doggone swell. It's packed with real wide-awake flavor, so fresh and crisp that, well, you'll want to eat lots of it. And because Pep is good for you, too. Mom will tell you that. Why, your regular breakfast bowl full of Kellogg's Pep gives you your whole daily minimum need of good old sunshine vitamin D and more than twice as much of an energy vitamin B1 as sun-ripened whole wheat. What's more, Pep is the prize package that brings you those snappy new second series comic buttons all the gang's collecting. Real humdingers they are. Brilliant colored pictures of favorite comic strip characters. Eighteen different buttons in all to collect and to trade duplicates with your pals. So better get busy. Make sure Mom gets you some more Kellogg's Pep. Because that's the only way you can get these thrilling comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. You get these swell prizes only in packages of... P E P Pep, the sunshine cereal made by Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. While Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen are waiting anxiously for word of the success or failure of the delicate operation on young Danny O'Neill, a strange scene is taking place far across the city. In a room of a penthouse, a room equipped as an office, Muggs, the juvenile gang leader responsible for both the fire on Morton Street and the brutal attack on Danny O'Neill, stands alone at one end of the room. Actually, he is not alone. Directly in front of him is a heavy plush curtain masking a wall. And behind the curtain is a man who, although unseen, is not unheard. His voice, thin, hard, and brittle, cuts through the curtain like a knife. Answer me, you little fool. Why did you do it? Why did you attack that boy? I I figured he'd seen us and was going to snitch. You're not supposed to figure. That's my job. You're supposed to take orders. Yeah, yeah, sure. Do you realize what you've done? Hasn't it yet penetrated that thick skull of yours that if that boy dies... You'll go to the chair? No, you, you said I'd get protection. I said you'd get protection if you followed orders. Nobody told you to beat up that boy. I only did How it many times have I told you that what we're trying to do is stir up trouble? Yeah, I know. You know nothing. If that boy dies, the organization I'm building here in Metropolis is ruined. We'll all have to get out of the city. Why? Why? Because when the police pick you up for murder and put the screws on you, you'll squeal. They ain't gonna pick me up. They ain't gonna. That's what you think. No, you're not leaving here until we know definitely whether the boy is dead or alive. If he's dead, the police won't get the opportunity to make you squeal. Hey, wait. What are you talking like that for? Because it's the only talk you understand. Why? Why don't you come up behind that curtain and let me talk to you face to face? Why don't I never get to see you? For a very good reason, Mug, so that you'll never be in a position to identify me. I have important work to do. My job is to stir up hatreds and prejudices, to divide the people, so that when we're ready, we can step in and take over. We're out to make the Jew hate the Christian, and the Christian hate the Jew. We tell the Catholic, the Protestant despises him. And we tell the Protestant, the Catholic despises him. Do you understand? Yeah, sure. That's why I can't take any chances. My work must go on, even if it means forever silencing your tongue. If that boy dies, you will have to be eliminated. No. No. So start praying, Muggs. Get down on your knees and pray that he lives. Great, Scott. Lois, heading for the storeroom. What'll I do? Can't get these clothes on fast enough. Have to take them with me. Finish on the roof. Up by the window. Oh, wait a minute. My tie. And my glasses. There. That's everything, I hope. Out and away! <laughs> Are you in here? I was sure I heard a voice just before I opened that door. Beanie! Yes, Come here a minute, will you? I don't understand this. Something I can do for you, Beanie, Miss Beanie, are you sure you saw Clark Kent come in here? Wasn't it, Miss Lane? He came out of Mr. White's office and he seemed like it was in an awful hurry. Ain't he in there now? No, he isn't. Oh, that's funny. Who opened the window? I don't know. Shouldn't be open. All the papers are flying around. Beanie, is this the only door to the storeroom? Yes, ma'am, the only one. And you're positive you saw Mr. Kent come in here? Oh, gosh, I, I thought I did, but... There he is, Miss Lane, stepping out of the elevator. Hi, Lord. 
Uh, I must have been wrong, Miss Lane. Hi, Beanie. Hi, Mr. Kent. Well, Lois. Did I win or lose? Win or lose what? Did Superman show up? Superman show up here? In Mr. White's office, Beanie. Did he, Lois? Chief first. You know very well he did. But I won. Come on, let's get that $10,000 check from the chief. Just a minute, Clark. What? Where were you when Superman arrived? Where was I? You heard me. Why, I was contacting him. Beanie says he saw you go into the storeroom. I Whoa. said I thought I saw him, Miss Lane. You said you were positive, Beanie. Mm, I must have been wrong. No, Beanie, you were right. I did oh. go into the storeroom, but I came right out again. I kind of thought I saw sure. you. Sure. Where did you go after leaving the storeroom? Now, look, what is this, a third degree? There's something fishy going on, Clark Kent, and you're mixed up in it. I think we're wanted, Lois. Jimmy spotted us. Lois, yes, come in here. Ah, oh, me, the master's voice. Let's go. <laughs> How do you want the check made out, Kent? Make it out to the Unity House Building Fund. Yes, Mr. White. Uh, Miss Backrack, tell Darwin to draw a check for $10,000 to the Unity House Building Fund. Unity House? No, no, not hose, house. Huh. H-O-U-S-E, Unity House. Oh, the Unity House Building Fund. That's right. Thanks, Chief. You've done a great thing. And so did you, producing Superman in 30 seconds. How'd you manage it, Kent? Do you expect him to tell us? I'm afraid Lois is right, Chief. I can't tell you. How long did it actually take from the time I left this office, Jim? Uh, exactly 27 seconds. Hey, not bad. No, not bad at all. Well, it's all over now, so let's forget it. We've got work to do. You can say that again. With young Danny O'Neill out of danger, the stage is all set. You spoke to Henderson? Yes, I did, Chief, last night at police headquarters. He agreed to play ball with us. I also explained the situation to Jimmy. Now, you're not going ahead with that fool plan to use Jimmy as a decoy, are you? Don't raise your voice, Lois. We're not deaf. <laughs> Pot calling the kettle black. What was that? Ah, uh, skip it. No, no, we're, we're not using Jimmy as a decoy, Lois. You said you were going to try to get him into that little hoodlum gang. What was his name? Muggs. Yes, that's right, Muggs. Well, Jim won't be a decoy, Lois. He'll be a spy. Well, that's worse, well, Clark. We'll start from the beginning, Kent. Let's get this straight. All right, here it is. A month or so ago, a committee was organized to raise money to build a gymnasium and playground for the boys and girls of the neighborhood. You know who's on the committee, Father Sheehan, Rabbi Stone, the Reverend Dr. Yes, Lee, yes, 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 we know. Now, skip the names, Kent. Okay. Well, soon after the committee was formed, the members began to get threatening letters. They were all warned to give up the attempt to build Unity House. Then the window of Hoffman's drugstore was broken and a fire was set. The following night, Danny O'Neill, who had identified one of the two boys who set the fire was severely beaten. You're just repeating things we know. Well, the chief said to start at the beginning. All right, all right. right. Go ahead, Kent. Well, I've talked with Father Sheehan, Rabbi Stone, and Inspector Henderson. We're all convinced this is an organized attempt to stir up hatred among people of different races and religions in Metropolis. And that's what the building's for. Right, Jim. The purpose of this is to prove to the neighborhood kids that they can get along with one another, even though they may go to different churches. And whoever's behind the attempt to stop it doesn't want that proof. I still say the only thing to do is arrest the boys who started the fire and make them talk. You know what will happen if we do? What? The higher-ups, the people behind Muggs, will run for cover. They'll hide out till this blows over. Well, Father Sheehan hit the nail on the head. He said like rats, they'll scurry for the sewer. No, but no, what that's I mean... no way, Lois. Even Henderson agrees we've got to play it smart. We've got to get to the top through the bottom, through Muggs and his gang. And the only one who can do that for us is Jim here. Well, Jimmy, uh... How do you feel about it? Oh, I think Mr. Kent's right. You, uh, you willing to tackle it? Oh, sure. Sure I am. I think it's disgraceful sending a child into a nest of gangsters. Well, A, Jim isn't a child, and B, he'll be carefully watched. Who's going to watch him? You? No, Miss Lane. Superman. Well, Clark, it's your party. Far be it for me to interfere. That's okay with me. Are you sure there's no danger, Kent? Of course there's danger, Chief. Plenty of it. Anything might happen. Well, I'm not afraid. Wait a minute. Does Jim's mother know about this? I'll take care of that, Lois. Well, what's your plan, Kent? Well, early this evening, we're going to dress Jim up in an old suit. You brought one down, didn't you, Jim? Uh-huh, and old shoes, too. Good boy. You see, we know the pool room where Muggs and his gang hang out. It's at 6th and Walnut. With Jim disguised as a young tough, he'll wander into the pool room and try to strike up an acquaintance with Muggs. And then what? Well, then it'll be up to Jim. If he plays his cards right, he may be able to join up with the gang. If he joins up, then we have a direct line to whoever's behind this hate campaign. Once we learn who they are, I'll step in. You? Well, I, I mean Superman. Well, then say what you mean. Now, stop talking as if you're Superman. I've never heard anything like the way You know, Jimmy, what you may be letting yourself in for. Yeah, I know. But if it'll keep kids like Danny O'Neill from getting hurt, it's okay. Well, I hope it'll do more than that, Jim. What we're trying to do is cut out something rotten in this city, something that spreads like wildfire unless you kill it at its source. Something called intolerance. Have suffer doing it, Jim. But believe me, it'll be worth it. Are you still game? Yeah, sure. Okay. Tonight at six, we'll strike the first blow. 
We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. You know, gang, we've got a new kid in our neighborhood, and uh, here's what he said to Rusty the other day. He said, comic buttons? Comic buttons? That's all I hear. What is this new game the kids are playing? Well, Rusty soon set him straight. He told him how all the fellows and girls are collecting a brand new second series of 18 different comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pep. Told him how smart-looking these buttons are, too. Each one with a picture of a, a famous funny paper character done up in full comic strip colors, like Maggie and, and Jiggs and Andy Gupp and Superman, of course. Then Rusty showed him his collection. You know, he has them pinned on his jacket. And then when the new kid asked how much these comic buttons of the new second series cost, well, Rusty really went to town. You don't send in a single penny, he said. Not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. They're the swell prizes we get in packages of Kellogg's Pet. And uh, that's the only way you can get them, too, gang. So you'll want to eat lots of that super delicious whole wheat flake cereal. Inside every package, you'll find a bright-colored, snappy-looking comic button. So ask Mom to get you lots of P-E-P, Pet, the sunshine cereal, made by Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. It is five minutes to six. Driving Perry White's car, Clark Kent approaches the corner of 6th and Walnut, where the pool room hangout of Muggs and his gang is located. Pulling over to the curb, he stops the car and turns off the ignition. Seated beside him, Jimmy Olsen, dressed in an old, somewhat ragged suit, wearing a cap, licks his lips nervously. Well, this is it, I guess. Yes, Jim, this is it. Sure that's the right pool room? Yeah, that's the one. All right, let's check everything once more, just to make sure. The most important thing is my phone number. Metropolis 4320. Right. It's 6 o'clock now. I'll expect to hear from you before 10. Either you'll call or show up at my apartment, right? Right. I've already spoken to your mother, and she knows you won't be home for a few days. Okay. What else? Well, let's see, Jim. If, if you get to Muggs tonight, go easy. See, don't rush it. If you can't make contact with him, well, just find out all you can about him. Well, how about my name? Hmm? Are you sure it's safe to use my right name? Oh, sure. Perfectly safe. They don't know you, and you just get mixed up using a phony name. Say, wait a minute. You haven't any identification on you. Have you a reporter's card or anything else? Oh, no. I left my wallet in the office. I've just got the $30 you gave me. Good boy. Now, spread that money around. Play big shot with it, you know. And don't forget, you're supposed to be a tough guy. Yeah, okay, bud. I'll be plenty tough. That's fine. Well, I guess it covers everything. Uh, you can still pull out if you want it, Jim. Well, not a chance. Good boy. I'll be at home waiting for your call. Right. Well, I'll... Wait, Jim. One more thing. What? I don't want you to be nervous or worried. In case anything unforeseen happens... That is, in case you get into trouble. Remember, we always have Superman on our side. I hope we won't need him. Well, I hope not, too, but if we do, he'll be there. So long, Jim. So long, Mr. Kent. Good luck. Thanks. Number six in a side pocket. Two bets you don't make it. I got a bet. Sucker. There you are. Clean as a whistle. Okay, Lefty, two bits. Get it up. Go on, I, I was kidding. Get it up. Okay, here. Uh, that was a nice shot, bud. Huh? Nice shot. Yeah, not bad. Now watch me sink that ten ball. Any dough on this, Lefty? Go on, shoot. Okay. Ten in the end pocket. Ah, you missed it. Ah, uh, this Q's got a cockeyed tip. Yeah, sure. All right, so I missed one. Let's see how many you drop. Wise guy. Yeah, you didn't do so bad. Watch him. Takes a year to make a shot. Yeah. Uh, you seen mugs around? Who? Muggs. I seen him come in about half an hour ago. Hey, Charlie! You seen Muggs? Hey, what's down at Greeks by hand He's down at Greeks. Where's the Greeks? Yeah, new around here, ain't you? Oh, yeah, I just blew in from... from Philadelphia. Guy told me to look Muggs up. There he is now, just coming in. What do you say, Lefty? Five in the corner pocket. Okay, shoot, will you? What's holding you up? Keep your short on. I'm taking my time. Okay. Hey, Muggs! Here's a guy looking for you. How about it, Lefty? All right, all right. I... You uh, looking for me? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Well, my name's Olson, Jim Olson. I just blew in from Philly. Chuck Connors said to look you up. Who? Chuck Connors. He said maybe you could tip me off to a couple of things. Oh, yeah? Who's uh, Chuck Connors? You mean you don't know him? No. Well, how do you like that? I told him I was heading for Metropolis, so he says, look up my pal Muggs. He'll set you straight, and he give me this address. Yeah? Boy, will I take a poke out of him next time I see him. You don't know him at all, huh? 
I don't know. I meet a lot of guys. Where'd you say you come from? Philadelphia. Why'd you come to Metropolis? I had a little trouble. Cops? Yeah. You got any dough? Yeah, a little. How much? Look, I don't like the idea of standing here and talking. Too many guys around. You don't have to worry about these guys. How much uh, dough you got? About 30 bucks. Oh, you want to wanna join my gang? Well, they get me. Protection. And, uh, and maybe some easy moolah. Easy what? Moolah, dough. Ah, sounds okay. It'll cost you 25 bucks. What for? Initiation fee. But that'll leave me busted. I gotta eat. You wanna join up? That's what it'll cost well, you. How about making it 15? Nothing doing. I'll pay you the rest later. No soap. How about 20? That'll leave me 10. I got an uncle living here, and maybe I can bunk with him for a while. How about it, Mux? Okay, but I'm letting you off easy. Let's have it. Yeah? I, 10, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. Now you're in. Oh, what do I do? Nothing. We're laying low for a couple of days. We uh, got into a little trouble. Cops? No, I poked the kid I figured was going to rat on us and busted his head. Jeepers. He almost cashed in, but now so the heat's off. We'll get working again maybe tomorrow. Oh, where do you hang up? Mostly here. You say your name's Olsen? Yeah, Jim. Okay. Where are you living? I guess with my uncle. He's over on 12th Street. All right. I'm here on this time every day. You uh, you come back tomorrow. Maybe something will break. And keep your lip buttoned. Oh, yeah, sure. Wait a minute. Hey, Dutch? Yeah? Come here. Ah, uh, shoot. Come here. Okay. Hold it, Dutch. What do you want? I uh, just took this guy in. His name's Olsen. Glad I know you. You the guy from Philadelphia? Yeah, that's right. I asked you where Muggs was. Look, in case I ain't here, Dutch will tell you what place. Okay, that's fine. Well... I'll be seeing you. So long. So long. What you soaking, Muggs? Twenty. How's about a fin? I'm flat. Here. Thanks. Now drop that cue and tail him. What? You hide me, tail him. I want to know where he goes. Why? Because I want to make sure that's why. Go ahead. Yeah. Where are you? In a drugstore. In a phone booth. Anything wrong? No. Everything's okay. I... I met him. Muggs? Yeah. And I'm in the gang. Good boy. He said they were laying low on account of Danny getting beat up. He actually told you that? Well, he didn't mention Danny's name. But he said he took a couple of socks at a kid and busted his head. When he said it, I wanted to take a sock at him. Yeah, I know, Jim. I know exactly how you feel. But we've got to play this game their way. In the dark. What else did you learn? Well, that's all. Except he introduced me to another kid. A kid by the name of Dutch. He said when he wasn't around, Dutch was... Huh? How old are these boys, Jim? How old? Oh, I guess maybe 16 or 17. They look older, but that's because they're all pale and sick looking from hanging around our pool room. Why, what a place. So full of smoke you can't breathe, and it smells to high heaven. What's your next move, Jim? I don't know. That's why I called you. Muck said to come back tomorrow night. He said something might break. All right, grab a cab and come over here. Oh, incidentally, did Muggs ask you where you lived? Yeah. I told him I had an uncle on 12th Street. That's you. Good. He swallowed it all right and... Gleeps. What is it, Jim? He, he followed me. Who followed you? I... Jim, speak up. Dutch, he followed me from the pool room. He... What? He was in the next phone booth all the time. He must have heard everything I told you. Where is he now? Just leaving the drugstore. He's going back to tell Muggs I'm a phony. Mr. Kent, what'll I do? Got to stop that boy. Stop him before he gets to the pool room. If he tells Muggs what he heard, we're licked. Up with the window. Out and away! Leaping out into the darkness, the Man of Steel hovers for a timeless moment in curious flight, then rockets across the city with the speed of a bullet. Below him now is the drugstore from Jimmy Phone. His sharp X-ray vision penetrates the black curtain of night and picks out the cap figure of a boy hurrying along a street two blocks from the store. Down he plummets, landing in a narrow alley hidden from prying eyes. Reaching beneath his cape, he produces Clark Kent's clothes and quickly steps into them. In a matter of seconds, he is striding down the street behind the boy, catching up with him as he nears the corner. 
Just a moment, son. Huh? I want to talk to you. Ah, your father's must be. Hey, come back here. Let's got that car. Look out! <laughs> oh, we hit him, a stupid little fool. It wasn't my fault. I had the lights with me. He, he ran right into me. Nobody's blaming you. Is he? Is he dead? No, but he's probably badly hurt. He's unconscious. Put him in the car. I'll, I'll take him to a hospital. All right, I'll go with you. Open the rear door. Okay. Hold it open wide. That's it. Oh, terrible. Simply terrible. All right, close the door and get going. Where to? The Metropolis Hospital. What does it look like, Doctor? Well, it's hard to say, Kent. Uh-huh. No bones broken, but there may be internal injuries. We won't know until we do a set of x-rays. Uh, whatever it is, keep him in a private room and build the Daily Planet. And above all, no visitors except myself. Well, we'll have to report this to the police, you know. Oh, that's okay. I'll clear it with Inspector Henderson. But remember, Doc, please, no visitors. I don't want that boy to talk to anyone. Why not? Because he knows too much. I thought I'd suffocate in that phone booth waiting for you. What took so long? Keep your voice down, Jim, till we get around the corner. All right. Okay, this is fine. Dutch is in the hospital, Jim. What? In the hospital? Yes. On his I... pool room, he ran across the street against the lights and was hit by a car. Jeepers. I don't think he was seriously injured. No broken bones. But he'll probably be kept under observation for a few days. Well, then, then that means we don't have to worry. He can't tell Muggs what he heard in the phone booth. Well, he won't talk for a while, at least. Long enough to give you a chance to get the information we need. Mr. Kent, how am I going to get it if Muggs is suspicious? If he keeps on sending guys out to follow me? You've just got to remove his suspicions. Uh, yeah, but how? Well, for one thing, Jim, you'll have to go back to the pool room and tell Muggs about the accident. Otherwise, when Dutch fails to show up, he'll suspect you. Uh, yeah, but how am I supposed to know about the accident? Well, uh, we'll figure that out. Let me think. Maybe if Hold I... Hold it, Jim, I've got it. Now, listen carefully. You go back to the pool room and tell Muggs that you were walking toward Market Street. I was walking toward Market Street, Muggs, and all of a sudden I heard this car pull up short. Yeah? Turn around. I could see he must have hit somebody. I ran over, but a couple of guys got there before me. They was carrying a guy who was hit into the car, and they were saying something about getting him to a hospital. You sure it was Dutch? Yeah, I got a good look at his face. I was going to tell the guys who were taking him to the hospital I knew him, but then I remembered what you said about keeping my lip button, so I didn't say nothing. You played it smart. If you opened up your trap, they would have took you to the hospital and asked you a lot of questions. Yeah, that's what I figured. Well, what do we do now? Nothing. We lay off. Dutch won't talk. We'll give him a phony name. There's only one bad thing. You know what's that? I had a job for Dutch to do tomorrow night. Oh, how about me doing it? You? Yeah, why not? I know the ropes. You don't know what we're doing. Oh, all you gotta do is tell me. You know anything about cars? Automobiles? Yeah. Sure, I, I worked in a garage back in Philly. Oh, yeah? Yeah, sure. Okay, wait a minute. Hey, Charlie? Yeah? Anybody in the back room? Nah. Okay, Olsen. You look all right to me. Come on in the back room and you low down. His throat dry and his heart pounding like a trip hammer, Jimmy follows the young gang leader to the rear of the pool room. What lowdown is Muggs going to give him? We'll know in a moment, so stand by. You know, I guess I'm a pretty forgetful guy. All week long, I've forgotten to put in a special plug for the girls who are collecting that brand new second series of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pep. And everybody knows the girls get just as much fun out of these slick-looking buttons as the fellas do. No wonder. It's mighty exciting when Mom opens a new package of pep to see which button you'll find inside. Maybe a character from this new second series that you don't have yet, like Andy Gump with his brush-like mustache, or Lord Plushbottom, or the Little King, or even Superman himself. Or maybe it'll be a, du du a duplicate, I'm trying to say, kids. Got a little mixed up, didn't I? So that you can have even more fun swapping with one of your friends. But whichever comic strip character it is, it's bound to be doggone smart looking. Brilliant colors, red and yellow and blue and black, on a gleaming white background. These pep comic buttons sure do show up. 
when you pin them on your jacket or your dress or cap. And they're so easy to get. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. They come only as prizes in packages of Kellogg's Pep. So ask Mom to get you some Pep tomorrow and look for your prize inside the package. That's P-E-P, Pep, the sunshine cereal made by Kellogg, the greatest name in cereals. Behind a closed door at the rear of the pool room that serves as a hangout for Muggs and his juvenile gang, Jimmy Olsen, swallowing nervously, waits for the young gang leader to tell him what he wants to know. Who is behind the campaign to spread hatred and intolerance throughout the city of Metropolis? Dropping into a chair, Muggs tilts it back against the wall, lights a cigarette, and blows a funnel of blue smoke toward the ceiling. Okay, here it is, Olsen. I'm going to deal to you right up the top of the deck, because I think you're the kind of guy I want working for me. Gee, thanks. Yeah, you used your head when Dutch got hit by the car. Plenty of guys would have opened up their yaps, so I'll come clean with you. Dutch was tailing you when you got hit. What? Telling me? Yeah, I sent him out to check up on you. Oh, yeah? What's the idea? In this racket, you got to be careful. You bloom with a story about a guy named Chuck Connors telling you to look me up. What do you mean, a story? Okay, okay, don't get sauce. I was wrong. Sue me. Okay. Where do we go from here? Now, look, here's a setup. We're working for guys with plenty of moolah. They got a job to do, and we're helping them out. We ain't doing it for love, but we ain't doing it for the dough alone, either. It's the kind of job we get a kick out of doing. Because it puts the skids under some of them foreigners lousing up the country. What are you looking at me like that for? Uh, oh, nothing. Nothing, only... Only what? I, I was just thinking. Ain't everybody in this country a foreigner? I mean, we all came from some other place, or our folks way back did. Look, Stu, cut the talk. You know who I mean. We're out to knock over anybody who don't play ball, you get it? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Right now, these guys we're working for are out to bust up some kind of committee trying to raise dough to build a clubhouse for kids over on Sutton Street. Oh, what's wrong with that? Our guys don't like this setup. They got a Jew rabbi and a Catholic priest on a committee. And the way they get it, give it out, they're going to open this clubhouse to any kid that wants to join. Don't matter if he's a Chinaman. How do you like that? Well, if the place ain't built yet, how can you bust it up? We're getting after the committee. We slept at the one of them night before last. Guy named Hoffman. Used to run a drugstore on the corner of Morton at 7th. <laughs> he don't run it no more. Oh, well, what happened? We burned it down. But that's only the beginning. Tomorrow night we're going after a Mick. A guy named Murphy. What are you going to do? Wait till I tell you. We got it all rigged up to go over to see hey, this. Hey, Mutz. Come on out here. What's up, Charlie? Dutch just come in. He says he got clipped by a car and they took him to the hospital. Yeah, I know. How'd he get out? Don't ask me. But he says he wants to see you bad. One of Muggs' young lieutenants, a boy known as Dutch, who overheard a telephone conversation between Jimmy and Kent and was returning to the pool room to report to Muggs when he was struck by a car, has somehow gotten out of the hospital where he was taken following the accident. Limping slightly and with an ugly bruise on his left cheek, the boy approaches the rear room of the pool parlor where Jimmy, his throat suddenly gone dry and his heart pounding like a trip hammer, looks about frantically for some means of escape. But there is no escape. Muggs is standing beside him. The door is blocked by the approach of the one person who knows he is a spy, and the pool room itself is crowded with members of the gang. Jimmy stands rooted to the spot, almost as though the steel jaws of a trap had closed on his leg. Meanwhile, in Clark Kent's apartment, the telephone is ringing frantically, with no one to answer it. Again and again, the bell cuts through the silence of the empty rooms, demanding attention. Finally, a key turns in the lock. The front door opens, and Clark Kent enters the apartment, hurrying to the phone and lifting the receiver. Hello? Is that you, Kent? Yes. Good Lord, man, where have you been? Well, I was out. I know you were out. I've been ringing for ten minutes. Who is this? Dr. Reynolds at the hospital. Oh, hello, Doc. Sorry, I'm... Hey, look, Kent, something's happened. Yes? That boy you brought in... Yes? The x-rays were negative. No internal injury. Oh, that's fine. I'm glad to hear it. However, I still want to... Wait a minute, Kent. Let me finish. Go ahead. The boy must have overheard one of the interns telling the nurse he had no injuries because he skipped. He what? He skipped. He sneaked out of the hospital. He's gone. Great Scott. He pretended he was asleep, and when the nurse left the room, why, he got his clothes out of the closet and sneaked down the back stairway. He must have been limping badly because he had a nasty contusion on his leg. When was this, Doctor? Why, about uh, 15 minutes ago, as near as we can tell. 15 minutes? I've got to work fast. He's on his way to the pool room, and that's where Jimmy is. What's that? Uh, well, nothing, Doctor. I- I'll be in touch with you. Uh, thanks for calling. 15 minutes, huh? I'll have to take him a half hour get there 20 minutes by taxi. Chances are he'd take the bus. Oh, let's see. How can I handle this? Got to prevent him from getting the mugs, but how? Is that Superman? 
No, no, no. That, that, that would ruin everything. Wait a minute. I've got it. Headquarters. Inspector Henderson, please. Clark Kent calling. Hold on, please. Right. The pool room's only five minutes from headquarters, and I can make it. Henderson and... speaking. Oh, Inspector, this is Clark Kent. Look, I need your help, and I need it in a hurry. I'd like one of your uniformed officers, either Sergeant Malloy or Lieutenant Quinn, to meet me on the northwest corner of 3rd and Crescent as soon as possible. I haven't time to tell you what it's about. Telling me, Mr. Kent, what you're looking for in a pool room. You'll see once we get upstairs, Sergeant. Follow me. And remember, let me do all the talking. Well, not having the faintest idea what this is all about, there isn't much talking I'll be doing. Watch these steps. Oh, dear, it's a wonder they wouldn't have a light a man could see by. Keep your voice down, my boy. Now, look. We have to make an arrest, Sergeant, once we get up there. And, uh, would I be arresting? You know Jimmy Olsen, don't you? The boy that works on the paper with you and Miss Lane? That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, he's the one I may want you to arrest. If you do, don't recognize him. Now, what sort of shenanigans have you got up your sleeve, Kent? Just do as I say, Sergeant, please. All right, you're the boss. The inspector said I was to take your orders. Fine. All right. Here we are. You all set? Go ahead. Come on, Sergeant. All right, stay where you are. Don't move. Nobody's going to hurt you. And if you don't move, you won't. All right, now, There's the boy we want, Sergeant. Just go into that back room. Come on. Oh, the devil's that. Close the door in our face. All right, we'll get it open. Open up in the name of the law. Come on, I said. Ah, that's better. Now, which one of the three was it? The boy with the bruise on his face. We'll take him back to the hospital. Come on. Come on, you rascal. You. And you. What's your name? Who? Who, me? Yes, you. What's your name? Why, uh... Uh, Jimmy. We'll take him too, Sergeant. Let's go. Rushing the boy known as Dutch out of the pool room before he has a chance to tell Muggs that Jimmy Olsen is a spy and taking Jimmy along in a surprise move, Clark Kent, at least for the moment, saves his plan from failure. The plan to learn the identity of the hate mongers behind Muggs and his gang. Now what will happen? We'll know in a moment when we return for today's exciting climax. You know, gang, people in ancient times used to think the sun so important they used its picture as a symbol of goodness and light. And that might hold for nowadays, too. Because the sun makes that wonderful sunshine vitamin D for you that helps build strong bones and teeth. That's one reason Mom wants you to clean up every last spoonful of your morning dish of Kellogg's Pet. Because this sunny, golden toasted cereal gives you your whole daily minimum need of sunshine vitamin D. Vitamin B1, too, an energy vitamin. More than twice as much as in sun-ripened whole wheat. Plus, loads of downright sunny, crisp goodness. And gang, when Mom reminds you to eat all of your bowl full of Kellogg's Pet, she's thinking of somebody else, too. Yes, she's thinking of young fellows and girls just like you who are going hungry these days all over the world. And she knows that wasting cereal here might mean less of the good golden cereal grains for those hungry children overseas. Because grains like the famous whole wheat and pet have been picked out to feed them and to help them grow up sturdy and strong. Keep that in mind, won't you, when Mom brings home a package of Kellogg's Pet from the grocers. Don't let one single flake be wasted. If you pour your own cereal, pour it carefully and eat all that you pour out. And tell the rest of your family to be careful, too. Care of your part of this job of taking care of hungry boys and girls overseas. With Dutch once more back at the hospital, this time under police guard, Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen returned to Kent's apartment. But meanwhile, Muggs, the young gang leader, frightened at what he thinks were the police arrests of Dutch and Jimmy, has hurried to report to the man he has never seen the mysterious individual who directs the activities of the hate-mongering organization and whose voice now comes to Muggs from behind a thick, plush curtain. Are you sure they said they were taking the boy back to the hospital? Yeah, that's what the guy in plain clothes said. What about the other boy? What was his name? Olsen. They didn't say nothing about him. They just took him along. And all this happened because of a street accident? Yeah, Dutch got clipped by a car. Olsen seen it happen and come back to tell me. This Olsen boy, can he be trusted to keep his mouth shut? 
Yeah, I think so. You think so? How much have you told him? Not much. How much, you little fool? Nothing important. He's all right. You don't have to worry. Your assurance that I don't have to worry is very comforting. Now you listen to me. If I've told you once, I've told you a dozen times. I don't want you or any of your roughnecks mixed up with the police. How could I help it if they can I'm not blaming you for this. I'm just repeating my warning. Okay. We're making good progress, and I don't want anything to happen that might interfere with it. How about the two boys? One you say was taken back to the hospital. That's what the dick said. It's probably correct. The stupid little fool had no business leaving until he was discharged. What about the other boy? Olson, you say? Yeah. Any first name? Yeah, Jim. Jim Olson. All right, you can forget about it. I'll have my lawyer check with the police and find out why he's being held. Well, maybe that ain't so smart. Maybe we ought to keep clear of it. Are you holding anything back? Oh, no, I ain't holding nothing back. I just thought that... I'll do all the thinking, Muggs. Want to know why they arrested that boy? There must be a reason. What's the matter, Jim? Huh? Come on, come on, snap out of it. What's the matter? Well, nothing's the matter, honest. Now, look, pal, stop fencing. Let's have it straight from the shoulder. Something's bothering you. I know it, and you know it. So out with it. Confession is good for the soul. Well, what am I going to confess? That little session at the pool room tonight frightened you, didn't it, Jim? Frightened me? Now, you don't have to be ashamed of fear, Jim. People are born with fear. It's a natural instinct, like hunger and self-preservation. Being afraid of something doesn't make you a coward, not by a long shot. Did you ever feel like your legs were made of water? And you couldn't breathe because something was choking you in the throat and and you got cold all over? Is that how you felt at the pool room? That's how I felt when I was in the back room with mugs. And the door opened and I saw Dutch come and taught us. All I could think was in another few seconds he's going to tell mugs I'm a spy. Then they're going to close the door. And I remembered what Danny O'Neill looked like in the hospital after they beat him up. You had a perfect right to be afraid, Jim. Well, you don't understand. I wasn't afraid of getting beaten up. That wasn't it. I wasn't even afraid of getting killed. I... I got cold all over because... Because I knew the minute Dutch opened his mouth, the whole thing was going to bust up. Yeah. Like you said, the rats would run for cover and we'd never catch him. That's why I was afraid. Mm-hmm. Well, it's all over now, Jim. Dutch won't open his mouth until we're ready to let him open it. You're still in the clear. I don't know. I don't know if I am. and I get worried when I think they might get wise. Well, how can they now? Dutch is the only one who knows and he's being watched day and night. Yeah, I know, but I'm still worried. I keep thinking if I miss the boat, if, if I don't come through the way you've got it figured out, there might be a dozen Danny O'Neills in the hospital. And some of them will die. Yeah, I know. And maybe a hundred stores like Mr. Hoffman's drugstore get burned up, just like it happened in Germany. You're right, Jim, you're right. And they won't stop with the Danny O'Neills and the Dave Hoffmans either. You see, it isn't just the Catholics or the Jews or the Protestants thereafter. That's only an excuse. Their game is to stir up hatred among all of us, to get the Catholic to hate the Jew and the Jew to hate the Protestant and the Protestant to hate the Catholic. An old trick. But for some reason, a lot of us still fall for it. Yeah, that's the trouble. Those kids in the gang, Muggs and Dutch and the rest of them, they don't even know what they're doing. The most important thing they don't know is that once the hate mongers get into power, they'll suffer as much as the Danny O'Neills and the Dave Hoffmans. I know. Oh, well, look, it's after midnight, Jim. You're tired. How about turning in? Huh? I don't know whether I can sleep. I've got a funny feeling something's wrong. What do you mean? I don't understand. I can't explain it, but I feel... Well, who's that this time of the night? Might be Miss Lane or Mr. White. Well, there's only one way to find out. Hello. Oh, hello, Inspector. Inspector Henderson? Yes. What was that, Inspector? Great Scott, no. What is it, Mr. Kent? Just a minute, Jim. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry, Inspector, but... Well, I know, but... Oh, now look, Inspector, there's no sense hanging on the phone arguing about it. Sure, I know, but the fat's in the fire. What we've got to do is either pull it out or quench the fire. Well, I'll be right down. Yes, immediately. Okay. Uh, is something wrong? Not something, Jim. Everything. Well, you must be clairvoyant. I must be what? Clairvoyant. You can see into the future. Who, me? A minute ago, you said you had a feeling that something was wrong. You don't know how right you were. Get your hat and coat, Jim. We've got to get down to police headquarters. Well, what for? Well, this may sound strange, but we're going to put you in jail. <laughs> Sure, that cell door's locked, Charlie. There's a dangerous criminal behind those bars. <laughs> oh, cut it out, Mr. Kent. This isn't funny. Ah, oh, you're right, Jim. It isn't. Well, that'd be all, Mr. Kent. Yes, that's all, Charlie. Thanks. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Yes. Sir. Uh, would you tell the inspector we'll be ready in, oh, five minutes? Okay. 
Now, Jim, we've got to work fast. Listen carefully, because one mistake, one slip, and we're in trouble. Oh, you better start from the beginning, then. I'm all mixed up. All right, keep your voice down. Now, here it is. There's a lawyer waiting in Inspector Henderson's office now. He won't reveal who's retaining him, but he came to headquarters to inquire about your arrest. You know, that phony arrest Sergeant Malloy and I pulled at the pool room? Yeah. That's why I arrest you down here, and that's why you're locked in a cell. Why? Because putting two and two together, this is what I get. When you were arrested and taken out of the pool room, Muggs immediately reported to his bosses. The higher-ups we're after. They evidently contacted this lawyer and sent him down here to find out why you were being held. The chances are he was told to get you out before the police could make you talk. Oh, now I see. Fortunately, Henderson didn't tell him you weren't under arrest. He just kept mum and called me. Oh, he could have told him I was released. Yes, but it's smarter than that. Much smarter. How? We're going to let the lawyer talk to you and then get you out. Once you're out, he may take you directly to the people we're after. The hate mongers behind Muggs and his gang. Oh, golly, you think so? It's a long chance, Jim, but it's worth taking. What you'll have to do is play tough and suspicious. Make him think you don't trust anyone. Oh, is he coming down here? Uh-huh. Henderson's going to let him talk to you. In fact, he can't help himself. Under the law, a prisoner has a right to see his lawyer. Well, do you have to call me a prisoner? Oh, it's just part of the act, Jim. Oh. Now, look, have you got everything straight? I think so. I'm to play tough and suspicious. That's right. He'll ask you why you were arrested. Your answer is you don't know. Uh-huh. Now, he may ask a whole lot of other questions, but just be cagey. Yeah. Act as though you suspect he's a he's a detective trying to trap you. Okay. Golly, I hope I can do it. Sure you can. Well, I better go now. He'll be down any minute. Uh, so long, Jim. And good luck. Thanks, Mr. Ken. I... I got a feeling I'm going to need all the luck I can find. We'll be back in a moment for the exciting climax of today's episode. You know, gang, old man's son is responsible for a lot of mighty fine things. Fact is, we just couldn't get along without him. But one of the best things he does for you is to make that wonderful vitamin D that helps build strong bones and sturdy teeth. And did you know, gang, that you get that very same vitamin D effect in Kellogg's Pep? Actually, your whole daily minimum need of vitamin D. Also, an energy vitamin B1, more than twice as much as in sun-ripened whole wheat. And Pep is the doggone crisp and golden and good-tasting that... Well, you feel like cleaning up every last spoonful in your bowl. And, fellas and girls, that's just exactly what you should do these days. Because Pep is made from whole wheat, one of the great cereal grains that's been picked out to feed millions of hungry fellas and girls overseas. Now, these children can't grow up big and strong if they don't have enough to eat. And they can't have enough to eat and help them. So, here's something mighty important that you can do. When Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make it your job to see that it's not wasted. If you pour your own cereal, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. Tell the family to be careful, too. Just make sure that you don't waste cereal, and you'll be helping to make sure that some fellow or girl just like you won't go hungry overseas. Locked in a detention cell at police headquarters after his phony arrest at the pool room used by Muggs and his gang as a hideout, Jimmy awaits the arrival of a lawyer, evidently engaged by the mysterious hate mongers responsible for the organized campaign of racial and religious intolerance in the city of Metropolis. As we rejoin Jim now, a uniformed guard is leading a short, thin man along the corridor toward the cell. They stop in front of him. The guard unlocks the heavy steel door. Ten minutes, Mr. Green. Thank you. Your name's Olson, isn't it? What's it to you? Now, look, my boy, I'm here to help you. I'm a lawyer. Oh, yeah? Who sent you? Never mind who sent me. Why'd they arrest you? What'd you do? I don't know. Well, you must have some idea. Oh, yeah? Stop saying, oh, yeah, and answer my questions. Why were you arrested? I don't know. How many times do I got to tell you? Did the cops talk to you at all? Who wants to know? I do. I told you I'm a lawyer. I've been hired to get you out of here. Yeah? Who hired you? That's unimportant. Oh, Yeah. Well, I ain't talking to nobody, see? Now, look, you can talk to me. I'm your lawyer. I'm going to help you. How do I know what you are? Maybe you're a dick. Muggs knows I'm not a dick. Yeah? Who's Muggs? You're a smart boy, Olson. They don't have to worry about you. Who don't? The people who engaged me to get you out. Yeah? Who are they? You wouldn't know if I told you. Now, listen to me. I ain't listening to nobody. You'd like to get out of this cell, wouldn't you? I'll get out. Not unless I help you, you won't. Sooner or later, they'll start questioning you. They'll make you talk. That's what you think. As a matter of fact, I... Now, listen to me. I told you, listen, I Listen, I said. My name's Walter Green. I'm the lawyer for the people you and Muggs work for. Now, the police haven't got a thing on you, and I'm going to get you out of here within the next half hour, if you'll cooperate. What do I have to do? Nothing. 
Just say you don't know why you were arrested. Yeah? Then what happens? They'll release you. Okay. Let's see you do it. I'll do it all right. You'll be free in half an hour. If I am, I ain't going back to the pool room. Why not? I gotta get to the boss. The big boss. Why? I got something to tell him. Something hot. You can tell me. Oh, no, I ain't that dopey. You don't trust me, do you, Wilson? I don't trust nobody. All right. Since you don't trust anybody, I guess we can trust you. Now, when I get you out of here... Yeah? When I get you out of here, I'll take you to the big boss. Jim. Is that you, Mr. Kent? Yes. How did you make out? Gosh, I don't know. I can't believe it yet. Can't believe what? He said he's going to take me to the big boss. What? The guy who runs... Oh, that's wonderful. Well, there must be a catch to it. I don't trust him. Why did he offer to do it? Oh, I don't know. Hold it, hold it. Someone's coming. Okay, it's Charlie making the rounds. He went down the other corridor. Now, why did he offer to do it, Jim? I don't know. Except I was acting awful tough and making out like I was suspicious of him, the way you told me. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden, he said I was a smart kid. And he was going to take me up to meet the big boss. But I think there's a catch in it. Maybe not. Where is he now, with Henderson? Yeah, I guess so. He said he'd get me out if he had to swear a writ of something or other. Habeas corpus. What's that, Mr. Kent? It sounds like Latin. It is. A writ of habeas corpus is permission granted by the court for someone to to have or possess a human being who is being unlawfully held by the police. Boy, someone sure figured things out. Yes, Jim, someone sure did. That's why we're all so jealous of American democracy, because it guards its citizens against abuses. You know what happened in Germany under Hitler? man could rot in jail before anyone could get near him. Oh, you mean what happened in Germany couldn't happen here? Unless we're mighty careful, it could. Hitler may be dead, but his mad, twisted ideas didn't die with him. There are still a lot of people who want power. Well, like, like the man we're after. And they know the best way to get it is to start trouble among different races and religions. That's what we've got to fight, Jim, and there isn't much time. Yeah, Green will be down again any minute. All right, now look, Jim, your hunch may be right. There could be a catch to this. But either way, you can't back out now. You'll have to follow through. Okay. Now, all I can tell you is be careful. Watch your step. Don't take any chances. Mm-hmm. Too much at stake. If Green does lead you to the man behind the hate campaign, you'll be stepping into a rat hole. Just remember, Jim, rats have sharp teeth. How far we gotta go before we get to where you're taking me, mister? What difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference. I don't like the looks of this. Relax, Olsen. Got you out of jail, didn't I? So what? They didn't have nothing on me. Look, you're a smart boy. You can go far. You keep your nose clean. How far am I going now? The large apartment house in the middle of the block. Who lives there? You'll find out in just a few moments. Hey, you wait here in the foyer, Olsen. I'll be right back. First, I want to know whose joint this is. I told you, you'll find out in a few moments. Now, wait there. Find out sooner than that, Mr. Green. I can. The story doesn't look very thick. Maybe I can you hear... You Olsen boy with me. Yes, I can. Why did you bring him here? Well, I thought maybe you wanted to see him. Why should I want to see the little gutter snake? I'll remember smart that, boy. you punk. Not smarter than much. I couldn't get him to open his mouth. Just wait till I start, Mr. Green. Is that supposed to be a recommendation for cleverness, a closed mouth? Well, I mean, I couldn't get him to talk. He was suspicious of him. And yet he allowed you to bring him here. I had quite a job talking him into it. I pay you to handle my legal business and the legal business of this organization, Green, not to conduct my labor relations. Why was he arrested? Well, he was being held for questioning about the automobile accident the other boy was involved in. Is that all? That's all as far as I could find out. First, they wouldn't let me see him. Kept me waiting almost a half hour. Finally, they realized they had nothing to hold him. Now, he's the kind of boy we need. Smart, fast, plenty of nerve. All right, bring him in. Take a deep breath, Olsen. This is it. Backing away from the door, Jimmy waits for it to open. His mouth suddenly gone dry and his heart pounding against his ribs. Yes, this is it. In a moment, the door will open and he will be led into the rat hole. And as Clark Kent said, rats have sharp teeth. What will happen? We'll know in a moment when we return for the climax of today's exciting episode. So stand by. You know, gang, this business of eating every last spoonful of your morning dish of Kellogg's Pep is mighty important these days. Of course, nobody has to be coaxed to eat Pep because it's uh, sunny and golden toasted and good tasting. And because it's good for you, too. 
why every one-ounce serving of Kellogg's Pep gives you your whole daily minimum need of sunshine vitamin D. There's an energy vitamin, too, B1, more than twice as much as in sun-ripened whole wheat. But you have other people to think about, too, when you're polishing off your breakfast bowl full of Kellogg's Pep. Other fellas and girls, just like you, who are hungry and undernourished. These children overseas need the good golden cereal grains to help them grow up sturdy and strong. That's why there should be no waste of cereals at your house. So when Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make yourself a committee of one to help guard against waste. If you pour your own cereal, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. Tell your younger brothers and sisters to be careful, too. Then you're doing your bit to help those hungry children overseas. Come in, Olsen. Ah, it's about time. You only waited a few minutes. Come in. Who's in there? Step inside and you'll find out. I don't see no one. You can hear me, can't you? Oh, who said that? I did. Where are you? Behind the velvet curtain directly in front of you. Stay where you are. Don't move. You can't see me. In fact, you're very fortunate to be able to hear me. What's this all about, Green? Just listen to him. Olsen? What? How long have you been working for months? I ain't talking. You can talk to me. It's perfectly safe. Oh, yeah? How do I know? What's your name? My name wouldn't mean anything to you. He's a tough man, Olsen. That's what you say. Why don't he come out from behind that curtain? Because my identity must remain secret. You know the type of work we're doing, don't you? What's that got to do with it? No one except a few close associates, such as Mr. Green, must know who is at the head of the Guardians of America. The what? The Guardians of America. That's the name of our organization. We have banded together to guard this country against the foreigners in our midst. We're going to protect America for those of us who have pure blood. You know what happened to the drugstore belonging to the Jew, Hoffman? Yeah, I know. The same thing will happen to all the members of the committee attempting to raise money to build an interstate community house. We don't want the Catholics and the Jews to get along with one another. We don't want Protestants to mingle with Catholics. If that happens, we'll never gain any power. People who are friendly and stick together are hard to control. We want them hating one another. That's why we spread stories around. We tell the Christians that the Jews are trying to take over the country. And we tell the Jews the Christians want to kill every one of them. But that's not... Of course, it's not true. But as Hitler said, if you tell a lie over and over again, people will begin to believe it. So what good did it do him? He got knocked off. Hitler was a great man, Olsen. He made only one mistake. He moved too fast. We're not making that mistake. We're going slowly. And you can go along with us if you wish. Yeah? How? Well, Mr. Green here seems to think that you're a very smart boy. I'm going to give you a chance to prove it. I'm going to give you a little job to do. What kind of a job? A very important job. A man named Klein owns an art gallery here in the town. There are some very valuable paintings in the gallery, paintings worth thousands of dollars. Now, Mr. Klein has contributed a large sum of money to that Unity House building fund, despite our warning. Are you following me? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I want you to buy yourself a new suit of clothes, <clears throat> get your hair cut, and pay a visit to Mr. Klein's art gallery. You can be a high school boy who has to write a composition on famous paintings, and you're looking some of them over. You'll take a sharp razor blade with you, and while you're looking at the paintings, you'll slash some of them. Oh, yeah? And what if I get caught? Well, if you're as smart as he thinks you are, you won't get caught. And I'll pay you $50 for each painting you cut. What? 50 bucks for each one? Yes. Okay. When do I do it? Tomorrow afternoon. I'll give you the address for the art gallery before you leave. And I'll also give you the names of the paintings I want to stroke. Mm, swell. And uh, one more thing. Yeah? If you handle this job properly... You can take Muggs's place as leader of the gang. The lawyer took me into a room just off the foyer. It was fixed up like an office with a desk, a couple of chairs, a big safe, and some other stuff. Never mind the furnishings. What about the man? Well, I couldn't see him. He was standing behind a black velvet curtain at one end of the room. Kind of black? Well, why? He said his work was too important to let too many people know who he was. Oh. I tried to get him to tell me his name or come out from behind the curtain, but no soap. What about his voice? Well, it was kind of flat and hard. Was that? Would you recognize it if you heard it again? I think so. It was a mean voice. Yeah, I shouldn't wonder. All right, Jim, now tell me what he said. What didn't he say? 
Honest, Mr. Ken, I had all I could do to keep from ripping down that curtain and pasting him in the nose. Yeah, I know. He never heard such stuff. For instance? Oh, all about how they were trying to get the Christians and the Jews to hate each other by telling them lies. Mm. He had the nerve to come right out and say that if you tell the Christians enough lies about the Jews and the Jews enough lies about the Christians, they'll get to believe them. Yeah, sure, that's what Hitler said. Go on, Jim. Well, he kept saying stuff like that, and I kept getting madder and madder. But I knew I couldn't show it, so I held myself back. Finally, he said he was going to give me a job to do because Green, the lawyer, thought I was a smart boy. Uh-oh, I was afraid of that. You were afraid. He told me what the job was. I could hardly catch my breath. What is it? I'm supposed to go to an art gallery owned by a man named Klein. And I'm supposed to slash some of the pictures in the gallery with a razor blade. What? Well, of all the dirty, disgusting things. He said Klein made a big contribution to the Unity House Building Fund, and they were out to get him. Oh. Well, here's a list of the pictures I'm supposed to cut up. Five of them. Mm-hmm. Two Rembrandts, a Rubens, a Franz Hall, and two that aren't familiar. You know what these pictures are worth, Jim? No, what? Well, the Rembrandts must be worth fifty to $100,000 a piece. Same with the Rubens. Jeepers. We've got to stop them, Jim, if it's the last thing we do. There's no end to a thing like this. From paintings, they'll go to people. They'll slash each one of us if we don't agree with them. Yeah, but what are we going to do now? I'm in a spot. If I don't do the job he gave me, he'll know I'm the spot. You'll do the job. Leap and lizard, you mean I'm going to cut up all those pictures? Oh, hardly. We'll double-cross them and still keep you in their good graces. In fact, you'll do this job so well that it may result in you're getting to meet Mr. Rat face-to-face. I don't see how I can do it. This way. In the morning, we'll contact Mr. Klein, the owner of the art gallery, and have a talk with him. We'll tell him all about this. And you think he's going to let me cut up his paintings? Certainly not. The paintings won't be cut up. At least, they'll only be cut up for publicity purposes. Just so your man behind the curtain will think you've done the job. Oh, I get it. We'll run a story saying the paintings were slashed, but actually they won't be. Right. I'm sure we can get Mr. Klein's cooperation. Oh, uh, one more thing before it gets too late. Was anything said about an attack on Rabbi Stone... You know, he's a member of the Unity House Committee. No, why? Well, I forgot to tell you this, Jim, but I got a call this afternoon from Father Sheehan. Seems Rabbi Stone received a letter warning him to resign from the committee or suffer the consequences. The letter said it was a last warning. Well, when did he get the letter? This morning. I just wondered whether maybe you'd heard anything about it. No, not a thing. All I heard, and Muggs told me in the pool room, was the next one they were after was Mr. Murphy. Oh? He's a member of the committee, too. Muggs said they had a special job to do on him. Oh, well, evidently they decided to save Murphy and go after Rabbi Stone. So what time is it, Jim? I watched stop. Uh, 20 minutes after 1. Mm-hmm. Would Muggs be at the pool room now? Yeah, I guess so. He hangs around there most of the night. Are you too tired to take a rundown and find out what you can about their plans? No, I'm not tired. Well, suppose you do that then, huh? At the same time, you can tell Muggs how you got out of jail. And, uh, incidentally, let him take all the credit. Mm-hmm, okay. Uh, what I do with my cap? Uh, well, here it is. Oh, thanks. I'll get back as soon as you can, Jim. I'll wait up for you. Okay. And, Jim? Yes? In case I haven't told you... Doing a swell job. Come on in here, Olsen. Okay. You only got a minute because we're going on a job. Big boss fixed it for you to beat the rap, huh? Yeah, thanks to you, Muggs. Forget it. You see, it's like I told you. We got protection. We're working for smart guys. They don't fool around. The lawyer took me up to the boss's hideout, Muggs. Oh, yeah? Yeah. How come the guy never shows himself? You see him? Yeah. He always talks behind that black curtain. Yeah, same with me. What do you have to say? Nothing much. I told him what a great guy you was. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, thanks, Olsen. Well, I got a blow now. Me and a couple of guys got a job to do. Well, how about taking me along? Huh? I ain't done a job with you guys yet. Okay. Okay, come on. What kind of a job is it? I'm going to mess up a Jew synagogue. Hey, Skinny. What this? Joe, let's go. Is this the same thing, Muggs? That kid's clubhouse stuff? Yeah, the guy that runs the synagogue, a guy by the name of Stone, he's on a committee for the joint. What are we going to do? Let's sneak in and bust up the synagogue. Creeps. What's the matter? You getting chicken hot? Well, no, no, but before I go with you guys, I, I think I'd better stop off in a drugstore. And, and, and what? I got a pain in my stomach. Something I ate, I guess. I'll meet you guys at the place. That's okay. We got time. We'll stop off at the drugstore with you and grab a Coke. Come on. Again, caught in a trap. Unable to contact Clark Kent to tell him the attack on Rabbi Stone's synagogue is going to take place immediately, Jimmy dies a thousand deaths as he follows Muggs and his young henchman out of the pool room. The excuse that he has a stomachache and would like to stop off at a drugstore hasn't worked. What can he do? We'll know in a moment when we return for the tense and exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. 
You know, gang, old man son does a lot more for you than just make a suntan in summertime. Sure, he's the guy who makes vitamin D for you. The sunshine vitamin that helps you grow strong bones and teeth. And did you know that Kellogg's Pep has this in common with sunshine? That very same vitamin D effect of sunshine. Why, just one ounce of Pep gives you your whole daily minimum need of sunshine vitamin D. Plus, twice as much of an energy vitamin, B1, as sun-ripened whole wheat. And is it good? Why, Pep is loaded with golden toasted flavor, crisp and crunchy as can be. So it's easy as anything to clean up every last bit in your bowl. And that's extra important nowadays, you know, because the cereal grains, like the famous whole wheat in Kellogg's Pep, have been picked out to give nourishment to hungry children overseas. So here's what to do, gang. When Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, just make sure it's not wasted. If you pour your own cereal, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. Tell your younger brothers and sisters to be careful, too. That's your job in helping to take care of fellows and girls all over the world for going hungry. Informed that Muggs and his gang of young toughs are about to make an attack on a Jewish temple of worship, Gilson made a desperate attempt to get away from the gang to call Clark Kent. He complained of a stomach ache and suggested he drop off at the drugstore to get something for it. But Muggs' reply was that they would all stop in with him and get a Coke. As we continue now, Jimmy and Muggs and three members of the juvenile gang are at the soda fountain of an all-night drugstore. How's gang well it be? Coke's for us, and this guy's got a pain in his stomach. In the chest, Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I'll give you a bite, can Okay. That'll fix you up, Alton. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Hey, yeah, uh, Bob. Bring it down. Thanks. Down the hatch. Go ahead. Yeah. That'll fix Ugh. you up. It always does the trick, don't it, Joe? Yeah, sure, every time. Oh, I still got the pain. Let's give it a chance. Come on, Coke. Hey, drink up, you guys. We've got to get rolling. How much real are you, Cap? Uh, 28 for the Coke and a dime for the bike, Cap. There's half a buck. Keep the change. Thanks, Bob. Okay, let's go. Come on. Hey, hey, Muggs. What's the matter? I, I still got the pain. Maybe I better not go along with you guys. Maybe I better sit here and wait till it goes away. Hey, Bob, maybe he's got appendicitis. I know a guy. Who oh, asked you? Okay. That ain't my funeral. You want to go see a sawbones open? Oh, no, no. I don't need no doctor. All I got is a stomachache. All right, you take it easy. Wait, I'll need you on this job anyway. Me and Lefty and Skinny and Joe can handle it, okay? Are you sure, Muggs? Yeah, sure. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay, Muggs. Thanks. Forget it. Come on, guys. I'm ahead of you, Muggs. Hey, Bob, where's it hurt you in your stomach? Uh-huh. Your stomach, where's it hurt you? Oh, it don't hurt so much anymore. I gotta make a phone call. Oh, boy. I thought I'd never get away from them. Mr. Kent's number? Oh, yeah. Metropolis 4320. 4320. I hope there's time to stop him. It's taken so long. Why doesn't he answer? I could call the police, but I'm afraid to without getting Mr. Kent's okay. Kent, please, Mr. Please. Kent, answer. There isn't much time. They're on their way. Please, please answer. Oh, he's not home. He must have gone out or... Well, he's asleep and the bedroom door is closed and... Hello? Oh, Mr. Kent, Jeepers, where were you? The phone's been ringing for almost five minutes and I was... Whoa, 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 take it easy, Jim. Take it easy, I can't take it easy. Muggs and his gang are on the way. They left here just Wait before I started to call you. We've got to Jim. stop him, Mr. Kent, Jim, if we listen don't... listen to me. I can't understand a word you're saying. Now, calm down and tell me what's the matter. It, it's the rabbi. Rabbi Stone. Yes, what about it? Muggs and three of his toughs are on their way to Rabbi Stone's temple. What? They're going to break in and, and do all the damage they can. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I was supposed to go along with them, but I made believe I had a stomach ache so I could get to a phone to call you and tell you. Where is Stone's temple? Oh, never mind, I know. On Clinton Street. Uh, yeah. Do you know where he lives? No, I don't, but... I'll look it up. Well, what are you going to do, call the police? No, no, no. This is a job for Superman. Golly, you almost sounded like Superman the way you said that. Huh? Oh, of course I have it, I guess. Uh, look, Jim, you better come on back to the apartment. I'll leave the key under the front door, Matt. Wait here for me. I'll be back as soon as I can. Where are you going? Uh, 
to get Superman. Well, can I come along to watch Superman give those guys their lumps? Look, in the first place, that's not what he's going to do. And in the second place, you've got to keep in the background. You can't let Mug suspect that you tipped me off. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. All right, I'll see you later, then. Okay, and Mr. Kent... Yes? If Superman does give them their lumps, tell him to park one on Muggs' nose for me. Shame to have to wake him up at this hour of the morning, but it can't be helped. Seems to be a light in a rear room. Ah, oh, here comes someone. A man, fully dressed. Could be the rabbi, except he's a little young. Oh, I'm sorry to disturb Am you, but... Am I seeing things? What? Oh, oh, this costume. No, no, it's authentic. Then, then you're Superman. Guilty as charged. Are you Rabbi Stone? Uh, yes, yes, I was working on a sermon. That's how I happened to be up this late. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, won't you come in? Well, I'm afraid there isn't time to visit, Rabbi. I've just learned that a mob of young hoodlums are on their way to smash up your temple. What? I believe we can still head them off if we hurry. That, that, that letter I received, it warned me about this. Lord in heaven, isn't anything sacred to those people? Evidently not. I suggest we get right over to the temple. Now, if you'll just swing your arm around my neck. Around you? We're going to fly? Faster than you've ever flown before. You're not afraid, are you? Afraid? Why, you know... Uh, you've never dropped anyone, have you? <laughs> oh, not yet. And I certainly don't intend to start with a clergyman. Are you all set? Uh, I guess so. Good. Up and away! <laughs> You say you saw them as we were flying over? Yes, they were just turning the corner of Lorimer Street. You having trouble with that key? I've been complaining about this lock for almost a year. One of these days, I'm going to get a screwdriver and fix it myself. There, there, finally. I'll turn the light on. No, 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 wait a minute. No light. But you can't see a thing in here. It's pitch dark. Remember who I am? Well, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I stepped right into that one. You can see in the dark, can't you? Almost as well as I can in daylight. Comes in handy now and then. I should think so. Well, how do we handle this? How many of them are there? There are four. All youngsters, 16, 17. The leader is a boy named Muggs. Where did you learn all this? I get around. Now tell me, what would be the easiest way for them to get in here? Well, break one of the windows and climb in, I guess. Mm, I doubt whether they do that. Too much noise. Well, then they'd have to jimmy one of the doors. Oh. Either the front door or the side door. That sounds like it's a side door. That's the one we came in, isn't it? Yes. All right, we'll let them force it. You say the lock needs repairing anyway... Once they're inside, with uh, you mean I will. All four? Well, I did a little boxing at college. I, uh, I can still throw a few punches. <laughs> Sounds funny coming from a rabbi. Do you know Francis Sheehan, uh, Father Sheehan at St. Catherine? Sure, of course I do. He was an all-American tackle for Holy Cross, you know. And he can lick his weight in Wildcat. Oh, I didn't know. When we're not busy during the summer, he and I run up to the Y gym and we do a little sparring. Uh, look, don't ever tell him I told you. But he's a sucker for a left hook. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say a word. You know, that's the trouble with a lot of people. They think religious leaders are a bunch of stuffed shirts. Maybe they used to be, but they're not now. Take a fellow like Leeds at the Methodist Church. He played pro ball to earn enough money to go through seminary. Now he coaches the church team, and believe me, his club can lick the pants off half the college teams in the state. And on top of that, he's a good preacher and a good minister and a regular guy. Well, it sounds like a combination you can't beat. You can't. And if more people got to know their priest or their minister or their rabbi, they'd soon find out how regular they are. Uh-huh. Especially youngsters. Now, take these four hoodlums we're waiting for. Hold it, it, hold it. Get ready to take them. They're here. Where? Well, we figured they'd be at the side door. You hear them? Yes. They're working on the door. Forcing the lock. Now maybe I'll get a new one. Well, since you're going to do the honors, Rabbi, I'd better duck down behind one of the pews. Uh, how far do you want me to go with them? Oh, not too far. Just give them a light thrashing. I want them scared more than anything else. Are you sure you can handle all four? If I can't, I'm slowing up, but I'll need light. Okay. I'll stand by at the switch, and once they're all inside, I'll flip it. Won't they see you? I move pretty fast. I'll be down behind a pew before they can blink. Uh, hold it now. I heard the door creak. Yes, they're getting it open. Watch it. Right. Okay, you guys. Come on. Okay. Close the door, let's see. Yeah. Light a match, Joe. Let's see where we are. Right. I'll show you where he is. What the? Light. Camera. Action. Blinded momentarily by the light flooding from the ceiling of the temple vestry, Muggs and his three companions blink in amazement at the unexpected reception. 
crouching low behind the pew, Superman looks on smiling as the fighting young rabbi moves in to give the hoodlums the thrashing they deserve. But unknown even to the man of steel, tragedy may soon wipe the smile from his lips. We'll be back in a moment to learn what happened. So keep listening. Gang, you've probably learned in school how important the sun is to the earth. But you know how important it is to you? How it makes vitamin D for you that helps you grow up with strong bones and teeth? And you know that you get your whole daily minimum need of sunshine vitamin D in your one-ounce serving of Kellogg's Pet. Yes, sir. And this sunny golden toasted cereal brings you more than twice as much vitamin B1, an energy vitamin, as in sun-ripened whole wheat. Pet gives you loads of doggone good eating, too. Sunshine, flavor, and crisp goodness. So it's no wonder you want to eat up every last spoonful in your bowl. And a good thing, that is, especially nowadays, when there are fellows and girls going hungry overseas. You see, the cereal grains, like the famous whole wheat and Kellogg's Pet, have been picked out to help feed those hungry children. So it wouldn't do for us to waste. Keep that in mind when Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers. If you pour your own cereal, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. Tell the rest of your family to be careful, too. Taking care of waste here is helping to take care of hungry children over there. Insisting on handling mugs and his three pool room companions himself, young Rabbi Stone, one of the members of the Unity House Committee marked for violence, faces the four hoodlums in the vestry of his temple. Closing in, he grabs Muggs by the scruff of the neck. Why, you dirty hey, someone someone paid you. some attention to you ten years right. ago. Right. Couldn't be breaking into churches and temples now. <laughs> Joe, get me. Yeah, oh, no, you don't. Is there any something to do? I'll do it. The shiv, Lefty. Lefty, the shiv. Come on. Fight, you college. Come on in and fight. All right. Close in. Get him. That's what you think. Okay, Lefty. Now. That does it. Let's scram. Come on. Well, that was short and sweet. Nice work, Rabbi. I... I didn't see the knife. Didn't see the knife? Great Scott, you've been stabbed. The, the one he called Lefty. He had his, his sleeve. Oh, how did I miss it? He, he said Shiv. Shiv must be knife. You're in a bad way. I better get you to a doctor. I, I... I've had enough of this, Kent. But, Inspector... I'm not going to sit by and let those hoodlums run riot. But, Inspector... You, you look saw at... the report from the hospital. No. Another fraction of an inch and that knife wound the rabbi got would have killed him. Right. Well, fortunately, it didn't. He's going to be all right. That doesn't alter the fact that those two-room bums committed a crime. But I still... Assault and battery with a lethal weapon. Why, I could send them up for ten years. Sure, sure. And what good would it do? What good? Society would be rid of them for a while. Fine. And within 24 hours, others would take their place. Well, that's a fine way to talk. Well, it's true. I suppose the court should never sentence anyone for committing a crime oh. because someone else is going to commit another crime in his place. Well, Mr. Kent didn't mean that. Did anyone ask you, Olson? Well, no, right. I... You know I didn't mean it that way. This is a special situation. Those boys aren't doing these things on their own. They're being ordered and directed. Now, we've got to get at the root of this evil. And the root is the man Jimmy talked to, the man who hides behind a black curtain. All right, let's get him. What are we waiting for? Haven't anything on him yet. But we will have within 24 hours. I'm not waiting 24 hours. Now, look. I the... agreed to go along with you when they set fire to those stores and almost killed the O'Neill kids. But enough is enough. Do you realize what the papers would do to me if they if they got hold of this? The papers have all been contacted by Perry White. They agreed to lay low, not to publish anything until we had a chance to thoroughly test our plan. And now we have that chance. Oh, yeah? Yes. Jimmy here has been given a direct assignment by the man we're after. He's going through the motions just to be able to get something on our black curtain friend. Once that's done, we'll have Jimmy's evidence and we can nab him and send him away for life. Well, how do I know this is going to come off the way you tell it? I promise you it will. Just give me another 24 hours. That's all I ask. Oh, please, Inspector. All right. 24 hours. Good. But not a split second more and that's fine. Oh, gee, thanks, Inspector. And you be careful, you little whippersnapper. I don't want you getting into trouble. Well, don't worry about me. I've got Superman right beside me. Sure words were never spoken, Jim. Well, we better get going. We've got plenty to do before we... Oh, go ahead, Inspector. Take it. Thanks. Anderson speaking. Who? Yes, he's here. Just a minute. For you, Ken. Oh, the office? I didn't ask. I'm not a telephone operator. Sorry. Here. Thanks. Hello. Yes, this is Clark Kent. Oh, hello, Father Sheehan. Yes, he's going to be all right. I should say it was lucky. What was that? When, this morning? 
Same kind, eh? Yes, I'll tell Inspector Henderson about it. He'll probably want to have the church police. I certainly will. Thank you for calling, Father. Right. Goodbye. Now what? Dr. Leeds of the Methodist Church, he's a member of the Unity House Committee, too, got a threatening letter this morning. The same sort of a letter Rabbi Stone received yesterday. Kent, we've got to put a stop to this. Exactly what we're trying to do. But nothing's happening. He gave me 24 hours, remember? Well, I'm not so sure I want to now. Why? First a druggist, then a newsboy, then a rabbi, and now a minister. Now, wait a minute, we mustn't lose our heads. That's exactly what they're hoping for. They'd like us to fight one another. I still say this needs action. You're going to get action, or my name isn't Su- Clark Kent. In the meantime, I suggest you throw a police guard around Dr. Leeds' church. I know what to do. It's just a suggestion. For you, Jim, I'm afraid we'll have to change our plans. We've got to find out, if we can, what form of violence they intend using on Dr. Leeds. Oh, how can we find out? I don't know. I guess you'll just have to go back to the pool room and contact Muggs. But, but coming over here this morning, you said you didn't want me to see Muggs again. I know. Because there was a chance he suspected I'd tip you off about the raid on Rabbi Stone's temple. That's right, but we can't help ourselves now. We've got to know when and where and how they plan to strike. See, they may not go after the church at all. He may attack Dr. Leeds himself. But what if Muggs does suspect me? We had it all figured out. I was to go through the motions of doing the job at the art gallery. So if he was suspicious, he wouldn't be anymore. Now, if I go to the pool room, I may be in trouble. That's right, Jim, but it's a chance you'll have to take. Now, wait a minute, Kent. You can't send him over there and let him stick his neck out. Don't worry about it, Inspector. Jim's going to a story that'll make them sit up and take notice. What do you mean, Mr. Kent? Just this. Up to now, you've been spying on them for us. Now you're going to spy on us for them. Hey, Skinny, see Muggs around? He's in a back room with Lefty. Okay, thanks. Hi, Muggs. Hi, Lefty. Ah, uh, Jewel. Come on in. Got something to tell you, Muggs. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It better be good. What's the matter, Muggs? You sword me? Go ahead. What do you got to tell me? You had a slip on knife to a guy at the temple last night, didn't you? How'd you know? Who told you? Nobody told me. How'd you know? Well, give me a chance and I'll tell you. Go ahead, spill it. All right. I was sitting in the drugstore where you guys left me when I got that stomach ache and they brought in a guy half dead. I heard them talking and they said he got knifed in the Jewish temple. So I figured you guys did it. What'd they say? They say anything about descriptions? No, the guy that got knifed after a while he come to. Cop asked him if he could describe the guy that did it and he said no. Ah, you see, Lefty, what I tell you... Oh, then you're a lifesaver. Lefty's been sitting here beating his brains out, figuring a bulls was going to nab him. Oh. Lefty done a knife in? Yeah, he had it. The guy was laying for us. No kidding? Yeah. I figured maybe some wise guy tipped him off, or maybe he was just there. Anyway, as long as he couldn't give the cops no descriptions, we were okay. Yeah. Didn't bust up the place then? No, nah, but Lefty sure put a lot of knife in that guy. You know who it was? Who? The rabbi. How do you know? Guys that carried him in the drugstore said it was him. I thought you knew it. Uh, we didn't know from nothing. All we knew was the guy was throwing a lot of punches and throwing them fast. I had to tell Lefty to slip into shift. Boy, are we lucky. Couldn't give no descriptions. Yeah, you sure are. What's the next job, Muggs? Who says we got a job? Huh? Just asking. I kind of figure I got to make up for fading out on you guys last night. I'm sure you I can pull jobs, too. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Know anything about uh, car engines? Automobiles? Yeah. Sure. I worked in a garage once. Remember I told you, in Philly. Oh, yeah, that's right. Did you ever rig a torpedo? A what? A torpedo. You hook it up to the engine, when a guy starts his car, it uh, blows up. Is that what you're going to do? Yeah. You want to help? Sure. Okay, left to here ain't feeling so good. You can take his place. Whose car are we going to work on? You'll see when we get there. When are we doing it? Tonight. And this time we ain't running into no trouble. This time, the job's going to get pulled right. We'll be back in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, there are so many keen ways of serving up Kellogg's Pep for breakfast that, well, maybe you haven't tried them all. Of course, Pep with milk and sugar makes a terrific dish. But for a little extra zip, try a Pep Banana Split. That's this week's Pep Dish of the Week, and it's a honey. Here's how it's made. Sprinkle a layer of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, in the bottom of your bowl. Top with half a banana that's been split down the middle, then more Pep and the rest of the banana. Add milk and sugar, and then pitch into your Pep Banana Split, a mighty slick combination. Mm -mm. What those crisp flakes of Kellogg's Pep do for that banana? 
Yes, sir, pep sunshine flavor and golden toasted goodness sure do rise and shine. Why, each spoonful teases for another until, first thing you know, you're finishing off the last smooth spoonful in your bowl. And a good thing that is, because this dish is good for you. What's more, it's off the beam to waste cereal nowadays when we're sending the cereal grains to fellows and girls across the seas. Keep that in mind, gang, when Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocer's. Make it your job to see that it's not wasted. Handle the package carefully if you pour your own Pep and polish off every bit you pour out. All sure to eat all your Pep. Don't waste it. Returning to Clark Kent's apartment from the pool room, Jimmy Olsen reports what he has learned through the Daily Planet reporter, who, as we know, is Superman. And that's all Muggs told me, Mr. Kent. I'm supposed to meet him at the pool room about 8 o'clock tonight. Mm-hmm. They're going to attach a bomb to the ignition system of a car, is that it? Yeah, he called it a torpedo. He didn't say whose car. No, but if the Methodist minister got the warning letter, I guess it must be his car. Yeah, probably. I better call him. What time is it, Jim? Uh, almost noon. Well, he'll be at home, I guess. I've got his number here in my book somewhere. Let's see. Oh, here we are. Dr. Charles Leeds, Metropolis 8532. Well, what are you going to tell him? Not to use his car. Oh. D, eight, five, two. You're to meet at the pool room at eight. Uh-huh. Right? That gives us plenty of time to have a talk with Inspector Henderson and make sure... Hello, Dr. Leeds. Oh, this is Clark Kent of the Daily Planet. Yeah, well, the reason I called, Doctor, was to ask you whether you had any intentions of using your car tonight. What was that? Oh, I see. Well, that's very interesting. I... No, no, nothing particular. Yes, I will, Doctor. Yes, at the first opportunity. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Jim, we're in trouble. Trouble? Dr. Leeds doesn't own a car. I don't know, Ken. Things like this make me wonder sometimes whether it's true that a soft word turneth away wrath. Maybe we are going about this in the wrong way. Maybe Inspector Henderson is right. Iron bars and a mailed fist. Oh, you know that's not so, Father. Yes, yes, of course, Jimmy, I know. I believe in the Ten Commandments, and I've tried to live by them. But when I heard about the murderous attack on Rabbi Stone, well, if those young hoodlums had been anywhere within arm's reach, I'm sure I... I, Well, I don't know what I might have done. I doubt that you'd have done anything violent, Father, but that's neither here nor there. Incidentally, it might interest you to know that while Rabbi Stone is recovering from the knife wound, Dr. Leeds is going to preach the sermons at the rabbi's temple. Well, that's fine, Ken, fine. And speaking of Dr. Leeds, we're still a little confused about the latest information Jimmy got from Muggs, that an attempt is going to be made to blow up a car. Leeds doesn't own a car. No, he doesn't. No, neither do you. Neither does Rabbi Stone. That leaves the three lay members of the Unity House Committee, Dave Hoffman, the druggist, George Murphy, the retired police inspector, and Mr. Walters, principal of the school. And you feel certain the attack will be against a member of the committee? Oh, sure it will. Well, it's anybody's guess, but up to now, every act of violence has been directed against a committee member. These self-styled guardians of America seem determined to keep you from building Unity House. Well, what about Mr. Klein? Who, Jim? Well, Mr. Klein, the man who owns the art gallery. Oh, yes, I forgot about him. Is this something I missed? Well, it's something we missed telling you, probably. Jimmy got a personal assignment from Mr. Rat himself, the high mucky muck who seems to be running the Guardians of America. An assignment to destroy some valuable paintings in an art gallery belonging to a man named Klein. Well, you're certainly not going through with it. Yes, we are, as the phrase goes for the papers. Well, Kent, I don't understand. Stores can be rebuilt and wounds can heal, but art treasures can never be replaced. Well, don't you worry, Father. Nothing will be damaged or destroyed. What we plan to do, and we would have done it today if this car business hadn't come up, is call Mr. Klein in and explain the entire situation to him. Undoubtedly, we'll get his cooperation. You mean he'll let you destroy his paintings? Oh, no, not really. Just for the papers, Father. You see, boiled down, what we'll do is fake a story and print it in the Daily Planet, a story to the effect that a vandal slashed and cut five or six valuable paintings in Klein's art gallery. The net of it will be that Mr. Rat will think Jimmy here has carried out his assignment and can be trusted implicitly. Oh, yes, now I get it. Then with that trust established, we're hoping he'll come out from behind his black curtain and let Jimmy get a look at him for future identification. And then what? Well, then the rest is easy. We'll nab Mr. Rat. We know where his hole is. Jimmy can identify him as the man who directed the hate mongers and who ordered Muggs and his gang to commit various acts of violence. And unless I'm dead wrong, he'll go up for life. So the only problem at the moment is whose automobile they plan to blow up. That's right. Dave Hoffman owns a car, but he's already been attacked. Of course, that doesn't eliminate him completely. Kent, what about George Murphy? The retired cop? That's right. Yes, he has a car. So has the school principal, Mr. Walters. They've all been warned to be on the lookout, though. In addition, Inspector Henderson has assigned a police mechanic to each one of them. He'll examine their cars before they drive them. Well, you seem to have covered everything. Well, what about Mr. Klein? 
I don't know. I don't think he fits into this picture, Jim. They wouldn't waste two attacks on him. Well, why are they attacking Klein at all? Because he's Jewish? You know, from what Jim could gather, he contributed to the Unity House Building Fund. Oh, I see. Oh, speaking of contributions, Kent. Yeah? That $10,000 check from your editor, Mr. White, came in this morning. Oh, good. I'll thank him for that personally, but I want to thank you for that piece in the paper. The what? Well, the write-up in the Daily Planet. Oh, well, what write-up? You mean to Just say... Just a minute, Jim. What was this all about, Father? Well, Kent, I'm surprised you don't know about this. I was sure you'd written the article. Oh, well, what's it about, Father? Well, wait a minute. I, I think I have the paper right here. There you are. It's right on the front page. Let's see, it, Father. What's it say, Mr. Kent? There's Unity House Fund Swelling. Planet announces $10,000 contribution. Oh, did you write it, Mr. Kent? No, Jim, I didn't. Let's see. The Unity House Building Fund earmarked for the construction of a gymnasium and playground whose doors will be open to all Metropolis children, regardless of race, religion, or color, was swelled considerably today when Perry White, editor of the Planet, announced a contribution of $10,000. Clark Kent reads the article in the Daily Planet. Almost at the same moment, someone else is reading it aloud with as much, if not more, interest. None other than the still unidentified leader of the Guardian of America. This contribution, together with the contributions of all those interested in the furtherance of better understanding among people, will go far toward achieving the goal, according to Father Francis Sheehan, Rabbi Harry Stone, and Dr. William Leed, interfaith members of the committee. Very interesting, don't you think, Eric? Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. Well, that sounds strange coming from you. How much did you spend in this country alone during the war trying to buy military secrets? That is another story. They are building a gymnasium, not a battleship. They're building nothing, I promise you. I was waiting for the Daily Planet to get behind this. Now we'll have to get behind the Daily Planet with a knife. How? I'll show you how. Call the pool room first and instruct mugs to come here as soon as possible. You know the number? Yes. And the code line? Yes. Tell Muggs his mother wants him. Right. And use the phone in the other room. I want to use this one to call the editor of the Daily Planet. You're joking. Don't look so shocked, Eric. What's wrong with my calling a newspaper editor? You are supposed to remain in the background. Don't worry, I will. I'm calling Mr. Perry White to invite him to play the lead in a little drama I've just created. I suppose you might call it a tragedy. The title could be... Death on Wheels. Death on Wheels. What does the mysterious leader of the self-styled Guardians of America mean? We'll know in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's episode. So keep listening. You know, breakfast sure does give your appetite the old come on when there's a bowl of Kellogg's Pep at your place at the table. Pep looks so sunny and crisp and golden that, well, you'll want to pull up a chair and pitch right in. And Pep the Sunshine cereal tastes just as good as it looks, believe me. Pep Sunshine flavor is so smooth and rich it, well, it kind of sparkles on your tongue. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is a surefire hit when it comes to brightening up breakfast. Sends you off to school in the right mood for a good day. You see, when there's Kellogg's Pep for breakfast, you're getting solid whole wheat nourishment plus... So it's a slick trick to polish off every single flake in your bowl. And here's another angle, gang. Nowadays, the cereal grains, like the whole wheat and Kellogg's Pep, are being sent to fellows and girls overseas. So it's not a good idea to waste cereal. No, sir. Keep on the beam when Mother brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers. Don't waste it. If you pour your own Pep, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. And uh, kind of keep an eye on your younger brothers and sisters, too. Just be sure to eat all your pep. Don't waste it. As the result of a newspaper article announcing that editor Perry White of the Daily Planet had donated $10,000 to the Unity House Building Fund, the as-yet-unidentified head of the hate-mongering organization calling themselves the Guardians of America has decided to direct his next violent attack against the gray-haired editor. As we continue now, we return to the study of a sumptuous penthouse apartment, headquarters of the so-called Guardians. Their unnamed leader is being addressed by a blonde, Germanic-looking man called Eric, who speaks with a trace of an accent. I have just called the pool room. Muggs will be here shortly. Good. Now we have to plan this so there will be no slip-up. You know the expression, kill two birds with one stone? I have heard it. Well, we're going to try to kill two enemies with one bomb. I do not understand. The original plan, as you remember, was to strike at that Methodist minister, Dr. Lee. However, we learned that he did not drive a car. And at the last moment, we switched to another member of that committee, the school principal. 
But we're going to switch back. How? Oh, the device is no good unless it is attached to the ignition system of an automobile engine. That's exactly where it will be attached. But you say the minister has no car. Listen. I'm about to call Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet. I think you will find the conversation very... Perry White speaking. Mr. White? Yes? This is Father Sheehan, Mr. White, of St. Catherine. Oh, yes. Hello, Father. How are you? Quite well, thank you. And you? Fine, fine. That's good. Oh, uh, did you get my check, Father? Why, yes. In fact, that's why I'm calling. First, to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, it's nothing, really. And then to invite you to attend the meeting to be held at my parish house this evening. The members of my committee would deeply appreciate some advice from you as the editor of the country's most important newspaper. Oh, I'll be happy to do anything I can, Father. I knew you would, Mr. White. Now, uh, uh, one more little favor. Name it and it's yours. I uh, assume you have a car? Why, yes. And uh, you'll be driving from your office to the parish house this evening? Yes, I suppose so. Well, then, would you mind terribly, Mr. White, picking up one of our committee members on your way? No, not at all. Who is it? Uh, the Reverend Dr. Leeds of the Methodist Church. If you have a pencil and paper handy, I'll give you his home address. Do you mean to stand there and tell me we haven't heard from Kendall Olson in 48 hours? Has it been that long, Mr. White? What do you mean, has it been that long? How long do you think it's been? Search me, Mr. White. I don't have a watch. Never mind. Where's Miss Lane? I don't know. I haven't seen her either for a long time. No, you haven't. No, Mr. White. <sighs> you don't seem to have seen anyone. Now, tell me, what do you do around here? What do I do? That's what I said. What do you do around here? That's what I thought you said. Well? What do I do? Yes, yes. What do you do? How do you occupy your time? Well, I, uh... I run copy and, and I go on errands, you know, get copy and stuff for the reporters, and I pick up papers from the floor, I mean, you know, crumpled up papers. You don't have to draw diagrams. Diagrams? I don't draw any diagrams. Oh, never mind. Skip it. What else do you do? Well, I, um, I say hello to people when they come in and I ask them who they want to see and... Uh... All right, all right, that's enough. How much are we paying you? $27.50 a week. And out of that, I give my Nobody's mother... Nobody's interested in your personal finances. Would you like a raise? Uh, a what? What's the matter? Can't you hear? I said a raise. Oh, oh, oh boy. Oh, what a fish like to swim. All right. Now, here's a chance for you to make some more money. I'll give you a $5 raise if you can find Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen. You mean $5 a week? What do you think? A day? Cheapers. $5 a week. Where am I going to find them? Well, that's your affair. If and when you do find them, tell them for me that... Perry White speaking. Oh, Chief. Oh, Kent. Surprised to hear from me? Is Olsen with you? Jimmy, yes. Now, just a minute. Beanie, the deal's off. No raise. I found them myself. No, wouldn't you know it? Now, get out. Hello? Get out and pick up papers. Hello? My box up the... Hello? Hello, Chief. Hello? Hello? Well, what's Hello? your hurry? I've been waiting for you for 48 hours. You can do a little waiting for me. I thought we'd been disconnected. Well, I'd like nothing better than to disconnect you limb from limb. Where have you been? Why haven't you kept in touch with the office? Wait a minute. Who's paying your salary? Whoa, take it easy, Chief. You know what I'm doing. Oh, I do, do I? Yes. What am I, a mind reader? Now, look here. You know perfectly well I'm working on a story. From the time it's taking, I'd say you were working on an encyclopedia. Uh-uh, uh, don't be sarcastic. This is important, and you know it as well as I do. Say, by the way, Father Sheehan got your check. Quite pleased. Yes, I know. He called me. He did? Yes. Matter of fact, I'm attending a meeting at his parish house tonight. Oh. I think you'd better come along. Well, I can't, Chief. I'll be busy. Busy? Busy with what? We're trying to ward off another attack on one of the Unity House committee members. Oh, uh, who is it this time? I don't know. Jimmy hasn't been able to get any details, but it's pretty serious. Well, if you ask me, the whole thing is pretty serious. And I don't like the way it's being handled. Now, you have no right to say that, Chief. After all, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, that's what you think. If I had my way... I'd blast those guys behind this hate business off the face of the earth. Oh, sure. I'd sure. use the power of the press to run them out of town. I'd print it in the biggest, blackest headlines I could find. Oh, no, Chief, look, we've gone over this a dozen times. Oh, so what? Well, running them out of one town into another doesn't solve the problem. Then clap them into jail. How can we? We have no evidence. You've got plenty of evidence against those hoodlums who set fire to Hoffman's store, I know. almost killed Danny O'Neill and stuck a knife into that rabbi. I know, I know, I know. I've told you before, though, Chief, they're just cat's paws. They don't even know what they're doing. Not much they don't. Well... Look, Chief, it's senseless to argue this way over the phone. You know we can't get anywhere this way. Then why don't you show up at the office once in a while? 
Or is that asking too much? Here we go again. Now, one of these days, Kent, you'll go too far. You really want me at the office? Yes. Bring Olsen with you. Well, that's impossible. Jim can't be connected with the planet till this thing is cleared up. Oh, all right. How soon will you be here? Twenty minutes. I'll wait for you. Goodbye. sure sounded mad. Uh, you know the chief, Jim, all bark and no bite. Are you going to the office like you said? Well, I'm afraid I'll have to just to keep peace in the family. What time is it, Jim? Uh, 4.30. When are you due back at the pool room? Mug said to show up around 8. Hmm. Well, you better stay here. Maybe you can catch a few hours sleep. Oh, I'm not tired. <laughs> you should be. The last 48 hours have been pretty hectic. I know, but I'm not tired, honest. I feel swell. Uh -huh. I'll sit around and read, play the radio. Okay. You'll be back, won't you? Oh, of course. I mean, before I go to the pool room? Long before. I told Inspector Henderson I'd be home all evening in case he needed me. I don't see how anything can happen now that we've warned the three members of the committee who own cars not to drive them tonight. And on top of that, Henderson has a plain clothes man watching each of their homes. Well, that takes care of everything, I guess. I can't tell, Jim. Something might break. And I want to be ready for it if it does. You think maybe Muggs gave me a bum steer on purpose? Hmm? A bum steer? I mean, you think maybe he told me they were going to hook a bomb up to the motor of somebody's car just to throw me off the trail? No. That that's not what they're going to do at all? Could be. Well, if he did, then it means he doesn't trust me. It means he's suspicious. No, well, that could be, too. Well, then maybe I better not show up there tonight. At the pool room, I mean. Oh, you've got to, Jim. If you don't show up and he is suspicious, it'll just confirm his suspicions. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Not only do you have to show up, but you've got to go out on this job. Oh, the detectives watching the three houses have been told not to make any arrests, just to see that no property is damaged, so you won't be in any danger. Oh, that's good. But I want you to go along so that you can testify later as an eyewitness. Whose houses are the detectives watching? The three car owners in the committee, Hoffman, Murphy, and uh, Walters, the school principal. Oh. The other three, Father Sheehan, Rabbi Stone, and Dr. Leeds, don't own cars. Oh, that's right. Oh, oh, hey, I better get going. Said I'd be there in 20 minutes. If I'm not, the chief will have epiplexy. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'll see you later, Jim. Okay. Alone in the apartment, Jimmy picks up a magazine, thumbs through it absently, crosses to the radio, turns it on, and while waiting for it to warm up, strolls to the window and looks down on the street. Suddenly, the color drains from his cheeks and his mouth gapes open. What has he seen? We'll know in a moment when we return for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, gang, old Mother Hubbard's got a new name these days. Sure, she's Mother Hubba Hubba when she goes to the cupboard for a package of Kellogg's Pep. Because Pep, the sunshine cereal, makes breakfast really hubba hubba. Boy, how those sunny golden toasted flakes do make your appetite sit up and take notice. And say, have you heard the word about Pep's dish of the week? This week, it's a pet banana split, as keen a dish as you'd ever want to taste. Now, here's the idea. You sprinkle a layer of Kellogg's Pep in the bottom of your bowl, top with half a banana that's been split down the middle. Then more Pep and the rest of the banana. Add milk and sugar, and then see how Pep's famous sunshine flavor and tender crispness do rise and shine. Why, you won't want to stop until you've finished the very last spoonful in your bowl, which is certainly a very hep thing to do nowadays, because Kellogg's Pep is made from whole wheat, and whole wheat is one of the cereal grains picked out to go to fellows and girls all around the world. So, gang, get hep to pep. When Mom brings Kellogg's pep home from the grocers, don't waste it. If you pour your own pep, pour it carefully and polish off every bit you pour out. And uh, kind of keep watch on your younger brothers and sisters, too. Get the right habit. Eat all your pep. Don't waste it. Alone in Clark Kent's apartment... Jimmy Olsen strolled over to the window to look out on the street. And suddenly, the color drained from his cheeks and his mouth gaped open. For there, standing on the curb directly opposite the apartment house, were two familiar figures wearing checked caps. Figures he identified immediately as Muggs and one of his young lieutenants, Lefty. As we join Jimmy now, five minutes have gone by. The two young toughs are no longer standing on the curb, but have crossed the street and entered the apartment house. Jimmy is on the phone connected with the Daily Planet switchboard, but at the moment, getting no response. Hello? Hello? Golly, why doesn't the chief answer his phone? Hello? Hello? Very wise speaking. Hi, Mr. White, this is Jimmy Olsen. Well, a voice from the dead. Are you still working for us, Mr. Olsen? Don't joke, Mr. White. I'm in trouble. Is Clark Kent there yet? 
Mr. Kent? The great Mr. Kent? Mr. White, please, they're coming for me. What's that? I said they're coming for me. Who's coming for you? Mugs and one of his gang. Is Mr. Kent there yet? No, he isn't. And what are you babbling about? They, they must have followed me to Mr. Kent's apartment. Then they must have waited till he went out. Now they're coming for me. Stop babbling. I'm not babbling, Mr. White. It's the truth. Are you sure Mr. Kent isn't there yet? Would you look in his office? Who do you think I am? Messenger boy? But, Chief, uh, I mean, Mr. White, they're coming for me. They're up here. There's the doorbell. They're here, Mr. White. They're here. I saw them cross the street and come into the apartment house. Any minute now, they'll be up here to get me. We'll be up here to get you. Muggs and Lefty. Oh. Muggs and Lefty. Oh, please, Mr. White, don't ask me questions. Are you sure Mr. Kent isn't in his office? Would you go and see? Why, I look like a messenger. But I tell... That's them now. They're ringing the bell. What? They're ringing the bell. Speak up, speak up. I can't hear you. They're ringing the bell. What'll I do? Who's ringing the bell? I told you, Muggs and Lefty. They're after me. Mr. White, you've got to help me. If they catch me in here, they'll... Wait a minute. Here's Kent. Oh, boy, quick. Put him on. Yes, Jim. What is it? Mr. Kent, Muggs and Lefty are after me. What? Hear that? Yes? They're at the apartment door. I saw them on the other side of the street just after you left. Then they crossed over and came into the apartment house. Uh Uh-oh. Now they're at the door. What'll I do? Don't do anything, Jim. Hang up and sit tight. But but suppose they force the lock and break in. They won't have time. Hang up now and don't make a sound. But I... I... Do as I say, Jim. Okay. They followed me from the pool room. They know I'm in here. They must have found out what apartment it was from the doorman. Any minute now, they're going to start working on the lock. Why did Mr. Kent tell me to hang up and sit tight? What good's that going to do? Here they go. They'll have that door open in no time. What will I do? I'm stuck. And Lefty's got that knife. The knife he used on the rabbi. You'll get me this time. There's no way out. What was that? Just me, Jim. Oh, Superman. Shh. Not so loud. Oh, you got here just in time. They're trying to force the lock on the door. Hear them? They won't get very far. Come on. We're going to take a little ride. Where to? Kent thinks I'd better take you back to the pool room so you can establish an alibi. But... But if they followed me here, they must know I'm a spy. They don't know anything. They suspect. Now, you've got to quiet their suspicions. And the best way is to step right into the lion's den. You're not afraid, are you? Uh, no, I'm not afraid. Good boy. Now, I'll leave you at the pool room, but be sure you get someone there to notice the time. That's important, because when Muggs and Lefty return to the pool room, your alibi will be you were there when they thought you were here at the apartment. And you've got to make it stick. I'll try. Shouldn't be too difficult. Ordinarily, it would take you half hour to get across town to the pool room, and I'll have you there in half a second. The difference in time should be your alibi. You all set? I guess so. Okay, here we go then. Out and away! Leaping through the open window with Jimmy Olsen in his arms, the Man of Steel hurtles across the city of Metropolis to the pool room hangout of Muggs and his gang in a desperate attempt to clear the boy reporter of suspicion. An hour later in the back room of the hangout, Jimmy once again playing the role of a young tough Attempts to convince Muggs he was not the one they followed to Kent's apartment house. Couldn't have been me, Muggs. You heard what Charlie said. I was here at ten minutes to four. Lefty and me seen you go in with a tall guy wearing glasses. Five minutes later, the guy comes out. Well, it must have been somebody else. We crossed over and asked the doorman if a tall guy with glasses and a skinny kid went upstairs. He says, yeah. And he gives us the apartment number. Oh, how could it be me if I was here? How could it, Muggs? I don't know. Well, you heard what Charlie said. I come in here at ten minutes to four. Well, what time was it when you saw this, this kid go in with the tall guy? A quarter to four. Oh, you see, Muggs, it couldn't have been me. I couldn't have got over here from there in five minutes. You know how long it takes. Lefty and me tell you. How could we get crossed up? Don't ask me, Muggs. I don't know. You was telling somebody else, that's all. We was telling you. How could you? I was here at... Shut the... up. Hey, Charlie. Yes? Come here a minute, will you? Okay. Go ahead, ask Charlie. He'll tell you. He'll tell you I was here. Right down, will you? Yeah. Hey, what's up, Muggs? Come in here a minute. I want to check on something. Close the door. Charlie, you sure this kid was here at ten minutes to four? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, how come you hit the time right on the nose? What do you mean, how come? Go ahead, tell him, Charlie. Tell him how... Shut up, you. How'd you know it was ten minutes to four, Charlie? Well, he come in, he asked for you, I told him I told him that you went out and he asked when you was coming back. Yeah. They said in about an hour. And then he asked what time it was, and they looked at my watch and it was ten minutes before. You see, you see, Muggs? Okay. Thanks, Charlie. I don't get this. Skip it, will you? Okay. (laughs) 
Now, do you believe me, Muggs? I don't know. There's something cack at about this. Lefty and me ain't no dopes. I well, almost got caught jimmying the door at a problem we thought you was in. Oh, no kidding. Hey, the guy with the glasses come back. I don't know why you don't think I'm on a level, Muggs. All right, forget it. All you gotta do is give me a chance to pull a job with you, and I'll show you I'm shooting square. Yeah, well, you're getting that chance. Tonight. Oh, am I going out on that job with you? Uh, fixing the car motor? Yeah. You and me alone. Whose car are we working on? I'm about to get a minister. A guy by the name of Leeds, but he ain't got no car. Oh, well, how are we gonna do it, then? How are we gonna rig the motor so it blows up if he ain't got no car? I told you, the guys were working for a smart cookies. They got it all figured out. Yeah? How? Another guy they're at is picking up this minister in his car. So we get the two of them at the same time. Oh, sounds okay. Who's the other guy? The guy with the car. Eh, some big shot. Runs a newspaper. His name's Perry White. Stunned, Jimmy stares at Muggs in wide-eyed amazement. His temples pounding and his heart choked up in his throat. The hate mongers are about to strike again. And this time, one of their victims is editor Perry White of the Daily Planet. We'll return in a moment to learn what happens. So keep listening. Say, if your appetite is a weary willy first thing in the morning, it'll sure wake up when you catch a glimpse of that breakfast bowl full of Kellogg's Pep. And you'll be all set to eat the solid sort of meal that helps start your day in high. Because these sunny golden toasted flakes of whole wheat look so terrific that, well, you can hardly wait to pitch in. And is that sunshine flavor smooth? Is that tender crispness keen? And say, does your appetite get a lift when you spoon up your first taste of those crunchy flakes of Kellogg's Pep? Yes, sir, breakfast gets the glad eye when Pep heads the menu. And your nutrition quota gets a boost, too, because Kellogg's Pep is good for you. Sure, it gives you solid whole wheat nourishment plus. So it's a slick trick to eat up every last bit in your bowl. And mighty important nowadays, too, because the cereal grains, like the whole wheat and pep, have been picked out to send to fellows and girls overseas. So, gang, this is no time to waste cereal. When Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make yourself a committee of one to help guard against waste. If you pour your own pep, pour it carefully and polish off every bit you pour out. Pass the word along to your younger brothers and sisters, too. You're on the beam if you eat all your pep. Don't waste it. Struck as though by lightning, when he learned that editor Perry White was marked for violence, Jimmy Olsen made every effort to get away from the pool room hangout of Muggs and his gang in order to warn either Clark Kent or Muggs, still not entirely convinced that Jimmy is on the level, refuses to allow him to leave the pool room. As we continue now, Muggs has gone out for something to eat, leaving Jimmy with Charlie, the owner of the pool room. Desperately is the hour for what may be a murderous attack on Perry White and the Reverend Dr. Leeds draws near. Jimmy pleads with Charlie to give him a break. I gotta get out, Charlie. I gotta go tell my uncle something. Call him on the phone. He ain't got no phone. I gotta go over to his house. You heard what Muggs says. You gotta stay here until he comes back. But, but I can't. I gotta go tell my uncle I ain't coming home tonight. He'll get sore if I don't. Please, Charlie, it'll only take me five minutes. Nothing doing. I'll give you ten bucks, Charlie. Good. And you sure want to get clear, kid, don't you? It's only on account of my uncle. He gets sore if I don't show up. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Oh, come on, Charlie. Be a right guy. Muggs will never know nothing about it. That's what you think. He won't, I tell you. All it'll take is five minutes and I'll be back. What time is it now? It's half past seven. Oh, golly, he'll kill me if I don't show up. Yeah, what do you think Muggs will do if I let you go? He won't know nothing about it. Honest, he won't, Charlie. Here, take the ten bucks. Please. Sit down, kid. Mug said for you to stay here and you're staying. So sit down and shut up. Okay. Hold up. The car ain't here yet. Get down behind a hedge. When it comes, we don't want to get caught in the headlights. How do you know it's coming? Get down and shut up. Maybe it was here and here already and left, huh? Getting chicken hot, Olsen. You want to pull out? I didn't say nothing about pulling out. Well, I said it was I me- know what you said. Don't worry. The guy that figured this out knows what he's doing. What guy? The head guy the outfit we're waiting for. He said the car get here about 8.30. We got five minutes to go. What if the car don't show up? Look, Olsen, stop asking questions. When a big boss rigs something up, it's rigged, see? You don't get his wires crossed, not him. He's smart, huh? They don't come no smarter. You got the thing we're supposed to hook up to the motor, Muggs? Are you kidding? 
Of course I got it. Where? I didn't see you carrying nothing. What do you think I'm going to do, stupid? Carry it around my neck? Got it in my pocket. Here. See it? Oh, is that all it is? Kind of a metal tube with a couple of wires, huh? That's all, but it packs plenty of punch. When it goes off, it'll blow the front of that car sky high. Where do we hook the wires? To the spark plugs. Hey. Here she comes. Where? Swinging around the corner. Kick down. That's it. Pulled up right in front of the house. There goes the guy up the walk. Yeah, I see him. Keep down, you lug. When we get in the house. Oh, well, what if you don't go in? He'll go in. See? There he goes. Okay, come on, we gotta move fast. Come on, get the hood up. Well, get it up, will you? It's stuck. I can't move it. Get out of the way. What do you mean, stuck? I couldn't move it. All right, shut up and keep your eye on the house. Tip me off, they come out. Okay. Okay. That does it. Put the hood down. You stupid lug, would you slam it so hard? I didn't mean to. Come on, let's scram out of here. Oh, oh. Oh, now what'd you do? I, I tripped over something. Well, get up before I come out of the house. I can't. I must have busted my ankle. You're crazy. Come on, I'll help you. No. No, I can't. I'll be coming out in a minute. We gotta get out of here. Maybe if you got a taxi. Where am I gonna find a taxi at? On the next street. Where the trolley runs. I saw one parked on the corner. Go get it. There ain't time. Sure there is. Go ahead. Okay, but if they come out before I get back, lay low. Yeah, yeah, sure. Lay low, huh? That's what you think. There he goes around the corner. Now to rip that thing out of Mr. White's car. I stalled as long as I could trying to get the hood up before. No stalling now. You wouldn't think a little thing like that could cause any damage. I guess it's filled with some kind of high explosive. I wish I could see what I'm doing. There. It's one wire off. Now for the other one. Boy, he sure twisted it tight around the spark plug. Having fun, old son? <gasps> what? Didn't take you long to get that busted ankle fixed up, did it? I, I was just checking to see... Yeah, you was just checking. I figured you for something like this. Honest, Muggs, I... You I, dirty little rat. Here, take a look at this hunk of lead pipe before I wrap it around your neck. Put that down and fight fair. I'm gonna bust your head wide open, you double-crossing little punk. I'm gonna kill you. That's what I'm gonna do. Wait, I'll show no, you that... You can't kill me. Down. Easy, Jim. Easy. Put You're all down. right. The water, Chief. There. Water? Water? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Here. Here. Thanks. Down. All right, Jim, now. Put Come down. on, son. Drink a little of this. Boy. Uh, uh, Candy, you sure he doesn't oh, need a doctor? Positive. Oh, Jim. No, much. Jim. Put it down. Snap out of it, Jim. Come on. Oh. Jim. Oh. Mr. Kent. That's better. Where? Where am I? What happened? I... Take it easy now. I... Everything's all right. But... Mr. White, the car. Hey, you saved my life, Jim. I'll never forget it. But, but the car and Muggs. What happened? I told you everything's all right. Dr. Leeds and the chief came out just in time to catch Muggs swinging a piece of lead pipe at you. Oh, that queers everything. He knows I've been double-crossing him. Wait a minute. Let me finish. Dr. Leeds chased him and caught him. Muggs? Uh-huh. He's on his way to police headquarters with Dr. Leeds and a couple of plainclothes men now. They'll keep him in a detention cell overnight. Well, that won't do any good. If he doesn't show up at the pool room, the rest of his gang will get suspicious. That's why you and I have to work fast, Jim. Uh, Chief, suppose you drive us back to my apartment. Oh, huh? okay. Oh, well, where are we now? This is Dr. Leeds' house. The chief carried you in here from the street and then called me. Oh, gosh, thanks, Mr. White. If you hadn't come out when you did, Muggs would have killed me. And if you hadn't risked your life getting that infernal bomb out of my car, I'd be spattered all over Kingdom Come by now. You think you can navigate on your own, Jim? I think so. Yeah, wait, I'll help you up. Make it easy. <laughs> That's it. You all right? A little unsteady, but I'll make it. Sure you will. The only thing is, I'm worried. How are we going to get the goods on those guys now that Muggs knows everything? Don't you worry, Jim. I've got it all set up. Tomorrow morning, we strike the final blow. Get the evidence we need and wipe the guardians of America off the map. What is Clark Kent's final blow against the hidden enemy of tolerance? We'll find out in a moment when we return for the startling conclusion of today's episode. So keep listening. 
Well, gang, today is the last call for the pep dish of the week. It's a pep banana split, a honey of accommodation for breakfast fun. You tried it yet? All you do is to sprinkle a layer of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, in the bottom of your bowl. Top with half a banana that's been split down the middle. Then more pep and the rest of the banana. Add milk and sugar, and then pitch in. Mm Mm-mm, Kellogg's Pep sure does things for that banana. Why, Pep's crisp tenderness and full sunshine flavor are way out in front when it comes to tickling your taste. Each delicate flake is so golden and toasty that a, well, a slick dish of Kellogg's Pep adds up to mighty snappy eating. Pep is good for you, too, sure. Gives you solid whole wheat nourishment, plus. And Pep is made from whole wheat, one of the cereal grains that have been picked out to send to fellows and girls all over the world. So, if you're sharp... You make it a point to eat every last spoonful of pep in your bowl because this is no time to waste cereal. When Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocer's, make it your job to see that it's not wasted. If you pour your own pep, pour it carefully and polish off every bit you pour out. Pass the word along to the rest of your family, too. Be sure to eat all your pep. Don't waste it. It is early the following morning. Clark, Kent, and Jimmy Olsen are not alone in Kent's apartment. With them is a kindly middle-aged man wearing silver-rimmed glasses. His name is Adolph Klein, and he is the owner of a well-known Metropolis art gallery. He leans forward curiously as Kent explains the reason for summoning him. I'll try to be as brief as I can, Mr. Klein. I know you're a busy man. Oh, there is no hurry, Mr. Kent, except that I am anxious to know what this is all about. Well, here it is. Some months ago, a committee was formed to raise funds to build a community clubhouse here in Metropolis. A clubhouse whose doors would be open to all youngsters, regardless of race, religion, or color. Yes, I have contributed to the fund. So I understand. That's why you're on the list. The list of contributors? No, the list of victims. Of victims? I'll explain. An organization calling itself the Guardians of America has been attempting to prevent the building of the clubhouse by committing acts of violence against those who are interested in the project. What? What? And you, probably because of your contribution, have been marked as the next victim. Good heavens. But how do you know this, Mr. Kent? Well, Jim here managed to join the juvenile gang doing the organization's dirty work, and he was assigned to destroy some of the valuable paintings in your art gallery. To destroy my painting? That's right. He was instructed to slash them with a razor blade. But I, I cannot believe this, Wyatt. It's like Germany under Hitler. Exactly. People said it couldn't happen here, but it is happening. We're trying to stamp it out before it gets too far, and we need your help. Well, please, what can I do? I will do anything. Well, your part in our plan is fairly simple, Mr. Klein. We, uh, we have a news story already prepared, a story to the effect that five of your most expensive paintings were slashed by a vandal. Yes. Now, we plan to run the story in the early edition of the Daily Planet. An hour or two later, Jimmy will appear at the headquarters of the so-called Guardians of America and report that he did the job assigned to him. I see. By that time, the leader of the organization, who has not yet been identified, will have undoubtedly read the news story. Oh, yes. Well, we're hoping that not only will he commend Jimmy for a job well done, but that he'll show his face. So that later, following his arrest, Jimmy can identify him. Is that clear? Yes, yes, it is very clear. But what do you want me to do? Well, the moment the story appears in the paper, you'll be flooded with inquiries. Just play along. Make it seem as though the paintings were destroyed. I see. Once the arrests are made, of course, we'll publish the true story. You, uh, you don't mind helping us in this way, do you? I will be happy to do all I can, sir. More than happy. All we need, Inspector, is another few hours. Is that asking too much? Yes. When you were in this office yesterday morning at 10 o'clock, I told you I'd give you 24 hours and not another fraction of a second beyond that time, and you agreed. I yes, but Inspector, Just a minute, we... Jim, wait a minute. Yes, of course we agreed, Inspector. We, we thought 24 hours would be time enough. But it didn't turn out that way. I'm sorry, no. Kent, but that's all the time you're going to get. But we've got... Now to... that we've got that young hoodlum mugs behind bars, we're going to raid his pool room hangout... Round up the rest of his gang and send them off to reform school. Look, Inspector, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Muggs and his juvenile gang aren't responsible for the things that have happened. You and I are responsible. Are you crazy? What have we got to do with it? Just a minute. Wait a minute, Inspector. Let's look at this sensibly. It all started three days ago. Or was it four? I don't know. I've lost track of time. Well, what difference does it make? It started with a Morton Street fire. Right. Two kids, a boy named Muggs and another one... Uh, uh, Skinny. Skinny, a boy named Skinny, threw a brick through the window of Dave Hoffman's drugstore and set fire to the the gauze perfume display. All right, why? How do I know why? What do you mean, how do you know? You know as well as I do, because Hoffman was a member of the Unity House Committee and these kids were told to set fire to his store. That doesn't make them innocent. 
Oh, you're right, it doesn't, but let's go on. Two nights later, the same boys, with the help of a few more, broke into Rabbi Stone's temple. Again, why? To smash it up. But why? All right, they were told to do it. And last night, they were told to attach a homemade explosive bomb to the motor of Perry White's car in order to, to get White and Dr. Leeds, the Methodist minister. And still, you think they shouldn't be punished. Oh, now, wait, Inspector. I never said anything of the sort. Huh? What I did say, and I say it again, is that Muggs and the rest of them may not be bad boys. It's the people behind them who are really bad. The, the, the dirty, slimy rats who got these kids to do their dirty work. All right, we'll run them in, too. Oh, that's just the trouble you won't. The minute this thing is given any publicity, the minute they learn you've raided that pool room and are holding these kids, they'll go underground, back into the rat holes. They'll wait until the heat is off, till it blows over. Then they'll come out again to feed on the people and spread their poison. And when you add up the score, what'll it be? You'll have half a dozen kids in a reform school, but the real criminals, the, the traitors who call themselves the guardians of America... They'll be free to get other kids to do their filthy jobs for them. And you think you've got a better way, huh? I know we have, Inspector. Huh? When Jimmy posed as a young tough and joined Muggs' gang, we started the ball rolling from the inside. If Jim hadn't learned what he did, Stone's temple would have been smashed up and Perry White's car would have exploded and probably killed him and Dr. Leeds. I'm not saying you haven't done a good job, Ken. Thanks. But now it's time to stop fooling around. Fooling We've got to wipe this out fast. Don't you understand, Inspector? You're not wiping it out. Remember what I said about poison ivy? You can't kill it by cutting off the leaves. You've got to dig out the roots. And these people, these hate mongers who should be called the enemies of America, they're the poison roots. Ah, you're dressing it up, Kent. Dressing it up, my eye. Why don't they want a place like Unity House built? Why are they trying to stop it? Jim, you tell the inspector, you know. Well, because they don't want Catholic kids and Jewish kids and Protestant kids to become friends. Right, why not? Well, because if they get to be friends, they'll stick together. They won't listen to guys like Hitler and Mussolini, who always start trouble by getting people to fight among themselves first. That's exactly the reason. It happened just that way in Germany. Hitler lied to the German people, told them the Catholics and the Jews were trying to take over the country. And these phony guardians of America are doing the same thing here, or trying to. And you think you can stop them, single-handed? No, not single-handed, but we can cut out some of the roots and kill some of the poison. All right, what do you want to do? No, oh, you're talking. Boy. Now, wait a minute. I haven't okayed anything yet. Oh, you will, once we tell you what we're planning. Well, let's hear it first. Okay, here's the setup. Now, when we pulled that phony arrest at the pool room in order to get Jim here out of a tough spot, the Guardians of America sent a lawyer down, a, ma a man named Green, to find out why he was arrested. I know all about that. Okay, okay. When Green got Jim out of jail, or thought he did, he took him to the headquarters of the Guardians, and Jim had a conversation with the big boss who didn't show his face, but talked from behind a black velvet curtain. Uh-huh. And he gave me a special assignment. Told me to visit an art gallery owned by a man named Klein and slash some valuable paintings with a razor blade. Old masters worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nice people. Yes, lovely. Well, at any rate, I got in touch with Mr. Klein, and we had a talk with him last night. He was more than happy to cooperate. Now, don't tell me he's willing to let you cut up his paintings. Of course not. Now, what we did, Inspector, was write a news story to the effect that someone did slash the paintings, and Mr. Klein agreed to go along with the story in case anyone questioned it. And what do you expect that to accomplish? Well, A, it should convince the big boss that Jim is on the level, and B, it may get him to step out from behind his curtain and show Jim his face, so that when you and your men grab him, we'll have positive identification. As it stands now, we can't prove a thing. No, we don't know his name, and none of us has seen his face. Uh, all this A and B stuff, when's it going to happen? Well, we thought we'd give them plenty of chance to see the story in the paper. I thought Jim could safely pay them a visit early this evening, say about 5 o'clock. Uh, what if it doesn't work? What if the guy doesn't show himself? Then you can step in and take over. Oh, thanks for the permission. Oh, now, wait a minute. I didn't mean it as permission, and you know it. What's going to happen when the other papers pick up your phony story and start pumping Klein? I told you. He'll play along. Well, what if they want to see these slashed pictures? He'll stall them. Don't worry about Klein. He's just as anxious as we are to trap these rats. I don't know. Well, it sounds pretty risky to me, but, well, if you think it'll work, I'll play along. Thanks, Inspector. Well, we're all set, Jim. Oh, swell. Let's go. Now, wait a minute. Let's get one thing straight. This is your last chance. Oh, we've agreed to that. Right, Jim? All right. Oh, but don't worry, Mr. Kent. I've got a hunch something's going to happen this time. We won't need another chance. <laughs> We'll return in just a moment for the startling climax of today's episode when Jimmy enters the headquarters of the Guardians of America. So stand by. Gang, right here we ought to have a fanfare, or at least a roll of the drums, to give a good send-off to this week's pep dish of the week. Because it's really a honey. It's a pep strawberry flip. 
as smooth a dish as you'd ever want to taste. Here's how easy it is to fix. You top your regular serving of Kellogg's Pep with plump strawberries. Then uh, take your spoon and give the whole thing a neat flip, carefully now, so you don't spill any, and see how the berries nestle down among those crisp, delicate flakes of whole wheat. Add milk and sugar, and you have a Pep strawberry flip, one of the dozens of keen ways to enjoy Kellogg's Pep come breakfast time. And I mean enjoy. Why, Pep is loaded with golden toasted sunshine flavor. It's called the Sunshine Cereal. Crisp and tender, too. So bang up good that, well, you want to dig in and finish off every delicious spoonful. And that's the right idea nowadays, you know, because you don't want to waste cereal when we're sending the cereal grains to fellows and girls across the seas. Keep that in mind, gang, when Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocer's. Make it your job to see that it's not wasted. Remember to handle the package carefully if you pour your own pep and polish off every bit you pour out. And uh, kind of keep watch on your younger brothers and sisters, too. Make sure to eat all your pep. Don't waste it. It is ten minutes after five. Fighting to control his nervousness, Jimmy has taken an elevator to the penthouse apartment occupied by the Guardians of America. After being questioned at the entrance foyer by a man with a slight German accent, he was led into the room in which he had been interviewed once before. Now, alone in the room, he faces the black velvet curtain strung across one end and licks his dry lips as he struggles to still the pounding of his heart. For long moments, he can hear only the faint ticking of a clock on the desk in front of the curtain. Then, suddenly, a muffled voice pierces the black velvet. I have been expecting you all afternoon, Lord. Oh. Oh, yeah? Yes. I read an account in the newspaper. Something to the effect that the Klein Art Gallery had been visited by a vandal. It seems that five valuable paintings were cut with a razor blade. <laughs> That's too bad. Yes, it is too bad. I suppose now you've come for your reward. Well, you said if I did the job good, you'd pay off. I certainly did, and I certainly will. In fact, since you approved yourself, I'm going to accord you a very rare privilege. I'm going to let you meet me face to face. Oh, Cleeps. What was that? Uh, uh, nothing. I, I, I kind of coughed. Just let me pull this curtain back. There we are. Now, Olson, let me shake your hand. You've done us a great service. My name is Frank Hill. Glad to meet you. Did you have any difficulty at Mr. Klein's art gallery? Nah, it was a cinch. According to the story in the Daily Planet, the paintings were completely ruined. Yeah, I slashed them up good. Well, that's fine. Now, before we discuss anything further, I should like you to meet one of my close associates. He's a man who's done a great deal for the Guardians of America. A great deal. He's waiting in the next room. This way, Olsen. Okay. Oh, uh, before we go in, I think I'd better warn you. You may be a little shocked when you see this man. Oh, yeah? Yes. In fact, you will be. Shall we go in? Suits me. Very well. Step right in, Olsen. You? Well, don't be rude, Olsen. Say hello to Mr. Adolf Klein. I believe you two have met before. Yes, we have met. It was in my art gallery, wasn't it, young man? Make certain, Adolf, this is a serious matter. There's no question about it. He was with Clark Kent, a Daily Planet reporter at Kent's apartment. I believe he, too, works for the newspaper. Is that true, Olsen? Answer me. I... I... No, it ain't true. I never seen him before. Close the door, Adolf. Yes. Yeah. The game is over, Olsen. You played for high stakes and you lost. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, perhaps I can explain. We've been suspicious of you for some time, and we decided to test you out by giving you an assignment on your own. You were told to destroy a number of paintings on display at Mr. Klein's art gallery. But what you were not told was that Mr. Klein has been a member of my organization for many years. Now you understand why I say the game is over. I... I did what you told me to do. May I suggest that you drop the tough accent? You're a clever little actor, but you're wasting your talent on us. You did what I told you to do, did you? Yeah. What actually occurred, Adolf? I received a telephone call from Clark Kent who asked me to visit him at his apartment on a matter of great importance. When I arrived, this young man was with Kent. That's a lie. <laughs> Next time, my hand won't be open. Go ahead, Adolf. Kent told me the whole story. How this boy had joined a gang working for the Guardians of America in order to learn who was at the head of it. 
The rest you know. Thank you, Adolf. Well, Olsen, now do you know what we're talking about? Answer me, you little rat, or I'll throttle you with my bare hands. Don't let go of me. Answer, then. Answer, or I'll kill you. I... Yes. Yeah, you admit spying on me. Yes. You admit trying to lead me into a trap? Yes. Why did you do it? Why did you do it, I said? You know why. Don't tell me what I know. I'm asking you. Because you set fire to Mr. Hoffman's store. Because you almost murdered Danny O'Neill. Because you're trying to get people to hate each other by spreading your lies and your poison. That's why. <laughs> Very amusing, isn't he, Adolf? Yes, Bill. Maybe it's amusing to you, but it uh, isn't to me. At the moment, I should say nothing would be amusing to you, Olsen. You're on a one-way street with a dead end, and when I say dead end, I mean dead end. You can't frighten me. I'm not afraid of your kind. You realize, of course, that now we've caught you, we can't possibly let you go. You understand that? Go on, keep talking. And since we neither have the facilities nor the desire to keep you as a permanent guest, there's only one thing that we can do. Tell me, how old are you? Don't give me that line about my being too young to die. You didn't worry about that when you told Muggs to beat up Danny O'Neill, a kid ten years old. Well, that was an unfortunate mistake. Oh, sure. The knife in Rabbi Stone's stomach was an unfortunate mistake, too, wasn't it? And it would have been an unfortunate mistake if Mr. White's car had been blown up and killed him and Dr. Leeds, the minister. You don't approve of our efforts to keep foreigners out of America, do you? And to send those who are here back where they came from or get rid of them? No. Because if you did that, there'd be nobody left but the Indians. Everybody knows that. Well, we'll teach them different. That's what Hitler and Mussolini said. They were going to teach the people, too. Do you remember what happened to them? Same thing will happen to you. Shut up. Don't like the idea, do you? Shut up, I said. Shut up or I'll... Go ahead. Go ahead, hit me. You're safe. Got your gang around. Well, now we'll see how brave you are, Olsen. How much courage all those fine words give you. We lock this boy in the vacant room at the end of the hall, that up. Tonight after dark, Eric and Clark will bind and gag him. Drive him to the Metropolis Bridge and drop him into the river. This is Collins in the composing room, Mr. White. We're still holding page one of the final edition open. Any orders? No orders yet. Just stand by. Page in the press room, Mr. White. When do we run the final? When I tell you to. Stand by. Well, getting impatient, are they? Now, look here, Kent. This is no laughing matter. That final edition should be out on the streets by now. I've held it almost 40 minutes waiting for that story. Well, Rome wasn't built in a day, Chief. I'm not building Rome. I'm running a newspaper. No. Right now, I'm paying a press crew room overtime. When, old, when was Olsen supposed to call? The minute he got clear. It won't be long now. Well, that's what said a half hour ago. Relax, Chief. For heaven's sake. Any moment that telephone's going to ring and we'll have the most sensational story of the year. You hope. I know. Jimmy never let me down yet. Too bad that you're letting your friend Mr. Kent down, Olsen. I'm sure he's expecting to hear from you. Well, don't lose any sleep over it. Oh, still the bright, young, smart Alec, aren't you? Yeah. And I'm sorry we haven't had time to furnish the room and equip it with a telephone, Olsen, but you'll only be in it for an hour or two. Thanks. You're quite welcome. I see you glancing at the window. Remember, this is the penthouse. We're 15 stories above the street. It's a long, long drop. Step inside. Oh, I uh, won't be seeing you again before Eric and Carl take you for your last ride. So, this is goodbye. Goodbye and good riddance. As the door slams behind him and a key turns in the lock, Jimmy momentarily loses his nerve. His lower lip trembles he stands helplessly in the center of the bare room. What can he do? How can he possibly escape? We'll return for the tense climax of today's episode in just a moment. So keep listening. Say, gang, when you hitch up your chair to the breakfast table in the morning, does your appetite sit up and take notice? Do you really want to eat the hearty sort of meal that helps start your day off right? Well, if it's a bowl of sunny golden toasted Kellogg's Pep you're hitching up to... Most likely, you can hardly wait to get started. Pep, you know, is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's loaded with smooth, full wheat sunshine flavor that practically sparkles on your tongue. Crisp, too, and, and tender and delicate. A royal sort of breakfast dish. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep certainly stacks up when it comes to really keen eating. And when it comes to nutrition, too. Because Pep gives you good whole wheat nourishment, plus 
So, you're in solid if you polish off every single toasted crisp flake in your bowl. And say, here's another angle, gang. Nowadays, the cereal grains, like the whole wheat and Kellogg's pep, are being sent to fellas and girls overseas. So, it's not right to waste cereal. When Mom brings Kellogg's pep home from the grocers, take special pains to make sure that there's no waste at your house. If you pour your own pep, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. And say, kind of keep an eye on your younger brothers and sisters, too. That's a cinch, isn't it? Just be sure to eat all your pep. Don't waste it. Trapped and exposed as a spy, Jimmy Olsen has been literally sentenced to death by Frank Hill, the hate-mongering leader of the Guardians of America. While Clark Kent and Barry White are waiting in the editor's office for Jimmy's telephone call, the young reporter becoming more desperate as the minutes go by and the first gray shadows of darkness creep over the city, is pacing his bare prison room. Stopping at intervals to try the door in the vain hope that somehow it has become unlocked. But no such miracle occurs and time moves on. Back and forth he paces, fighting off the fear and panic of utter helplessness. Suddenly he starts toward the window. Off in the distance he can hear faint music, strange music. He raises the window and leans out. Far below an organ man is grinding out a melody while a monkey dances at the end of a chain. Jimmy's hands dart into his pockets. In a moment he has a scrap of paper and the stub of a pencil. Laboriously he writes an instruction and a message. Take this to Clark Kent, Daily Planet newspaper. He will give you a dollar. Mr. Kent, I am locked in a room at their headquarters, 205 Willow Road. They are going to throw me off the Metropolis Bridge as soon as it is dark. Come at once. And bring help. Jim. You weren't thinking of jumping out that window, were you, Olsen? Oh, what window? There happens to be only one window in the room. You're standing in front of it. We heard it slam shut just as we unlocked the door. I... I wanted some air. Oh, and you suddenly decided when the key turned in the lock that you'd had enough air. Is that it? Yeah. Well, so we're what? going to give you a little more air, Olsen. It occurred to me that since you were here once before, that you undoubtedly gave this address to Mr. Kent and the police. Since it might be somewhat embarrassing if the police suddenly arrived and found you here, we've decided to move you until it's dark enough to get rid of you permanently as planned. You'll go along with Eric and Carl. That's what you think. Don't come near me or I'll kill you. Wait, Carl. He's got a knife. A silly little pen knife. It won't look silly, Jan, between your ribs. Now, you're just making things more difficult for yourself, Olsen. You can't get out of this room. That suits me. I'm willing to wait till the police come. Oh, so you did give them the address. What do you think? Carl. Yes? In the closet in my office on the top shelf, you'll find a small tear gas spray gun. Bring it to me. Yes, and in just a moment, we'll see how long you stand there brandishing that ridiculous knife. I'm all through standing. Look out, Eric. Did he get you, Eric? Ah, he just cut my sleeve. Ah, oh, the dirty little rat. I guess he figures he's got nothing to lose. Here's the tear gas, boss. What's up? He pulled a knife on us, forced us out of the room. Now reach out and open the door, Carl, and then step aside. If I can shoot some of this stuff in his face, it'll take all the fight out of him. He's careful now. He's leaning against the door. Stick it open. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's no good. You'll have to hit the door with your shoulder. You, you said he's got a knife? Well, what of it? He'll take a swipe at me. Well, you don't have to hit the door hard. Now, push it. He's only a kid. He can't hold it shut very long. We've got to get him out of here. I don't like this too much. Well, neither do I, but we can't help ourselves. Now, go ahead. I'll cover you with the tear gas. If he shows himself, he'll get a fistful. Okay. That's it, Carl. You're getting it. He's weakening. He's pushing he let go of the door. I'll fell into the room. He's going to knife him. All right, grab him, Eric. He can't see. I said. Oh. All right, let him go. I'm blind. I can't see. Where you're going, Olsen, there's nothing to look at. Take him away. <laughs> blinded, his eyes burning like live coals. Jimmy is led from the room by Frank Hill's henchman. Meanwhile, an editor Perry White's office at the Daily Planet, where White and Clark Kent have been waiting for a telephone call from Jimmy, Kent is beginning to worry. I don't understand why he hasn't called. Uh, because he's Olsen, that's why. 
Because he hasn't a brain in his head. Oh, Chief, that's not Does he true. think I can hold the final edition until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? What time is it? 7.30. We're an hour late with it now. No. I can't no. hold it any longer. He can't story on Oak's story. But Chief, he's bound to call. When? Next Tuesday? I'm sorry. I've got to get that paper out. Baker, press room. Perry White. Put page one back into the form and let her roll. Chief, can't you wait another five minutes? Not a minute. Let her roll, Baker. Okay. Well, that's that. I should have done it an hour ago. No, oh, I knew that kid wouldn't come through. Something must have happened to him. If anything did, it's your fault. I told you right from the beginning not to let him get mixed up with those hoodlums. You'd better call Henderson. No, I can take care of it. You can take care of what? I know where he went. I wanted to steer clear of the place till Jimmy got the evidence we need, but now maybe I better look it over. Oh, don't you be a fool too, Kent. Call the police. It's a job for them. No, it's a job for... For whom? For me. I'll be back as soon as possible, Chief. Now, wait a minute. Where are you going? To look for Jimmy. Good thing this storeroom is empty. If you ever decide to use it as an office, I'm in trouble. Off with these clothes. <clears throat> Don't understand why Jimmy hasn't called. Something must have happened. But what? Well, I'll find out soon enough. As Superman... Up with this window. Out! And away! Leaping out into the gathering dusk, Superman circles high above the Daily Planet building, hovers for a moment in curious flight as he determines direction, and then red cape streaming in the wind rockets across the city faster almost than the speed of light. In a matter of seconds, he is again hovering motionless in midair, this time above the apartment building on Willow Drive. Jim said they occupied the penthouse apartment. There it is, directly below me. But there's no one there. It's empty. That's strange. I wonder where Jim could be. By a curious twist of fate, even as Superman voices his thoughts, a black sedan is speeding away from the apartment building on Willow Drive. And in it is Jimmy Olsen taking what Hill, the hate monger, called his last ride. <laughs> Stand by for the tense, exciting climax of today's episode in just a moment. Say now, I'll bet you never realized how much those golden crisp flakes of Kellogg's Pep can do for a plump, juicy strawberry. But if you'll have a Pep strawberry flip for breakfast, you'll find out. Sure, that's this week's Pep dish of the week, you know. And it's a humdinger. Why, it's practically out of this world the way that famous sunshine flavor and that tender crispness seem to rise and shine. Just try it. Here's how easy it is to make a Pep Strawberry Flip. You pour out your regular serving of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and then you put some fine ripe strawberries on top. Then take your spoon and very carefully give the whole thing a neat flip so the berries are scattered all through the delicate, tender whole wheat flakes. Good? Why, it's a smooth dish, gang. Fact is... No matter how you serve it, Kellogg's Pep always tastes so good, you want to eat up every last spoonful in your bowl. And, uh, you know, nothing could be smarter nowadays when we shouldn't waste cereal. Because whole wheat is one of the cereal grains picked out to go to fellas and girls around the world. So, gang, when Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make sure it's not wasted. Handle with care is the idea if you pour your own Pep and eat up every bit you pour out. Just remember, eat all your pep. Don't waste it. Darkness has fallen over the city of Metropolis like a black shroud. Darting through the starless sky like some giant bird, Superman has checked every possible place that Jimmy Olsen might be. The pool room hangout of Muggs and his gang, Jimmy's house in the suburbs, his own apartment that he occupies as Clark Kent, even police headquarters. But the boy reporter is nowhere to be found. Now, once again, in his guise of the mild-mannered reporter, we find him with Editor Perry White in the latter's office. What time is it, Chief? Uh, it's five minutes later than it was when I told you five minutes ago. This is no time for jokes. Oh, it's 20 after 8. Why don't you call the police, Kent, instead of mooning around here like an idiot? I can't. If I call them, Henderson will raid the pool room and throw a monkey wrench into the works. The whole idea of this plan was to get the evidence on whoever was behind the hate campaign before we pounced. So what have you got? No evidence and Olson's missing. For all we know, he may be dead. We won't have any trouble with him, Eric. He's half dead now. 
Get that rear door open. Maybe you have tied the gag too tight. Maybe he cannot breathe. So what? He won't be breathing anyway five minutes after he hits the water. Open the door. Yeah. Grab his feet. Yeah, yeah. All right. Swing him in. Yeah. Good enough. Who's driving? I will take it. You're sure it's dark enough. Plenty. By the time we hit the bridge, it'll be pitch black. Let's go. What is the setup again, Carl? Simple. We drive to the middle of the bridge, stall like we had a flat until there's no traffic, then drag him out and heave him over. It's a 200-foot drop to the water and the tide's going out. We can't miss. Nine o'clock. It's been gone almost five hours. How much longer are you going to wait before calling the police? For all you know, he may be dead by now. That's a pleasant thought. Well, it wasn't meant to be pleasant. You're responsible for that boy, Kent. I know. You sent him into that rat's nest of killers against my better judgment. All right, all right. Remember my telling you... I remember, Chief. I remember everything. What's that got to do with it? The important thing is that Jimmy's missing and we don't know where he is. Then why don't you do something about it instead of beating your chest and tearing out your hair? I've done all I can. I checked every possible place he might have been. Their hideout, the pool room, his mother's house, my apartment, even police headquarters. When did you do all this? When I left you an hour or so ago. Well, you were only gone a matter of 20 minutes. What'd you do? Sprout wings? I suppose you could call it that. Ah, you're crazy. I've heard enough of this talk. If you won't call the police, I will. No, wait. I'm all through waiting. But it might ruin everything. Jimmy may be all right. Anyway, the police can't do any more than I've already done. No, no. Who do you think you are? Super Ann? I don't think I know. What's that? Nothing, nothing. Hang up, Chief. Will you wait? Wait another 15 minutes. Okay. 15 minutes, but no more. Better take a look at him, Carl. See if he is all right. Who cares? Take a look. Okay. Join the light, Olsen? He doesn't answer. <laughs> I think he's got something in his mouth. Who tied that gag too tight? So what? Uh... He'll want it to look like he drowned. We are supposed to take the ropes and the gag off him before we toss him over, in case the tide does not carry him out as they pick up his body. He's still alive. I can hear him breathing. Oh, turn right here and take the causeway. It's shorter. How long do you figure it will take us to get to the bridge? Fifteen minutes. No more. Roaring into the darkness, the black sedan carrying Jimmy Olsen to his death heads for the Metropolis Bridge 15 minutes away. The same 15 minutes Clark Kent and Perry White have agreed to wait before calling in the police. Meanwhile, far across the city, in what passes for the parlor of a poorly furnished three-room apartment deep in the slums, the one person who has it within her power to save Jimmy's life is seated in a chair, mending the pocket of her father's coat. She is Maria, the daughter of the organ grinder, to whom Jimmy dropped a message when he was locked in a room of Frank Hill's penthouse headquarters, a message the old Italian could not read. And now, as the car carrying Jimmy draws closer and closer to the bridge, the message itself on a tiny scrap of paper is crumpled in an ashtray at Maria's elbow discarded after she had found it in her father's pocket. From the kitchen of the flat, a cheap alarm clock ticks the time away, time that is so precious to Jimmy. Finally, the mending job is finished. Putting the coat aside, Maria happens to glance at the ashtray. Something impels her to reach for the scrap of paper, unfold it, and read the message again, her lips shaping the penciled words softly. Please take this to Clark Kent at the Daily Planet newspaper. He will give you a dollar... Dear Mr. Kent, they have locked me in a room at 250 Willow Drive. They are going to throw me off the Metropolis Bridge as soon as it gets dark. Please come and bring help. Jimmy. Puzzled, Maria looks up. Her father is fast asleep on a threadbare couch at the far end of the room. Rising, she crosses to the couch and shakes him gently. Papa. Wake up, Papa. Uh, 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 what, what's the matter? Papa, look. Yeah, well, what, the carissimo? This piece of paper, Papa. Mm. I found it in your pocket. Oh, mother of Dios. For this, you wake me up. It's got some writing on it. It says to take it to a man on a newspaper. Oh, yeah? Is that so funny? Where'd you get it, Papa? It's a wrap around the two bits the fellas a drop from a window. Where? Well, I forget a big apartment in the house. On Willow Drive, maybe? Yeah, that's it, the Willow Drive. A man dropped it from a window? Yeah, with the two bits. Eh, what does she say to paper? It says he needs help. 
He's locked in a room, and they're going to throw him off the bridge. Hey, what's that? Are you sure? That's what it says. I'm going to go downstairs. Uh, what the fool? I'm going to call this man Clark Kent and tell him. I'll be right back. <laughs> Being left to the next corner, pretty close to the bridge now. You can see the light. Yes, I see that. I sure will be glad to get this job over with. Well, it will not be long now. Five more minutes, Kent. I'll take your word for it, Chief. You don't have to announce it minute by minute. You know, Kent, sometimes I think you're a fool and sometimes I think you're a genius. All right. Here you are eating your heart out because Jimmy Olsen's missing. Instead of doing something about it, you wait. That may be Jim. Hello. I'd like to talk to Mr. Clark Kent. Uh, this is Clark Kent speaking. Oh, m- my name is Maria D'Angelo. My father came home with me. Hello? I- I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you talk louder, please? I said my name is Maria D'Angelo. Yes? What is it, Kent? I don't know yet. Yes, yes, go ahead. My father is an organ grinder. You know, with a monkey. Yes? And he came home from work a couple of hours ago with a piece of paper that had a message on it. A message? Yes, it has your name on it. It's from someone named Jimmy. Jimmy? Good Lord. Kent, what is it? Wait, Chief, please. What does the message say, miss? Do you want me to read it to you? Yes, please. It it says, please take this to Clark Kent at the Daily Planet newspaper. He will give you a dollar. Then it says, dear Mr. Kent, they have me locked in a room at 2.50. All right. Slow down now. Almost at the center of the bridge. Not much traffic is there. That suits me fine. Pull over to the right, close to the railing. Okay, this is far enough. Hold up. Yeah. Give the motor. How does it look? All right. I'll get out and you open the trunk and play around with the tools while you cut the ropes on his arms and legs. Leave the gag on till we're ready to toss him over. Okay. Make it fast, Eric. All right. We've got to get rid of him and be out of here in 60 seconds. 60 seconds, one solitary minute. Can anything save Jimmy now? We'll be back in just a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So keep listening. Say, you know what's a real catchy eye-opener when you come down to breakfast first thing in the morning? A bowl of Kellogg's Pet. Yes, sir. These crispy golden toasted flakes of whole wheat sure do give the go-ahead signal to your appetite every time. They're crisp, they're tender, they're full up with snappy sunshine flavor. They're delicate flakes of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Good for you, too. Sure, your mom knows that. Because Pep brings you that famous whole wheat nutrition and more. Just show me a fellow or girl who can resist the proper solid sort of breakfast when Kellogg's Pep heads the menu. Why, every single spoonful is a rare treat in itself. Every crunchy flake is so terrific that, well, you want to polish off every last bit in your bowl. And you know, that's mighty important nowadays, because the cereal grains, like the whole wheat and Kellogg's Pep, have been picked out to send to fellows and girls overseas. So, gang, this is not the time to waste cereal. When Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make sure there's no waste at your house. If you pour your own Pep, pour it carefully and eat up every bit you pour out. And say, pass the word along to your younger brothers and sisters, too. Get hep to pep, gang. Eat all your pep. Don't waste it. Parked at the center of the huge span of the Metropolis Bridge, Frank Hill's two henchmen, Carl and Eric, prepare to perform the last horrible act in their drama of murder, dropping Jimmy's half-conscious body into the dark, swirling river hundreds of feet below. Meanwhile, in Perry White's office at the Daily Planet, Clark Kent is still on the phone with Maria DeAngelo, the organ grinder's daughter. Yes, yes, I've got that. Go on, miss. Then it says, they are going to throw me off the Metropolis Bridge as soon as it gets dark. Great Scott. Kent, what is it? Do you want me to read the rest? No, no, that's enough. Thank you. Now, look here, Kent. Don't bother me now, Chief. I've got to go. Oh, no, you don't. You come back here. Let go of my arm. You're not leaving this office until you come. Let go of my arm, I said. I don't care what you said. Once and for all, you... I'm going to have to do something drastic, something I don't want to do. You can do anything you want, except... right, here goes. is clear. Get him out of the car. Rip the gag off. Don't bother untying it, Rip it. Yeah. Is this off? Okay. 
Now, up and over with him. Good thing he does not weigh much. I would hate to have to handle a 200-pounder this way. You're not kidding. All right, this is far enough. Now, just lift him up and toss him over the railing. You know, Carl, I think Hill made a mistake telling us to take the ropes and gag off him. Why? What, if he can swim? Are you kidding? He's half dead now. I know, but he might revive when he hits the water. Uh, Don't worry. It's a 200-foot drop. He'll hit so hard his back will break. Come, Uh, we're wasting time. Up with him. Yeah. <coughs> oh, oh, oh. What's the matter? Come on, Chip. He kicked me in the stomach. He was making so trouble crossing the Oh, help. Oh, help. Thank you, Mary. I got oh, his help. arms. Uh, help. Keep your hand help. over his mouth. Oh, I, I lift him up. Carl, there's a car coming. Yeah. He can't stop now. Help. We got to get him over. Help, help me. He's help. holding on to the island. Push him over. Help. Push hard. That's it. A little more. There he goes. Fighting a desperate last-minute battle to save himself from being thrown off the bridge, Jimmy is no match for the two grown killers. With his clutching fingers finally torn from the island railing, he plunges down through the darkness, his body twisting and turning like a sawdust doll, his arms flailing the air helplessly. Down, down he plummets, down towards certain death in the angry, rushing tide water of the Black River. Meanwhile, less than a mile away now, calling on every last bit of strength in his powerful muscles, Superman cleaves the darkness like a shaft of scarlet light. Suddenly, his amazing vision picks up the turning, twisting body, plummeting down toward the river. Great, Scott. It's Jimmy. I'm too late. I can't make it. No, I've got to make it. I've got to. Faster. Faster! Arms outstretched. The man of steel dives for the surface of the river, almost like a bird of prey, draining his vast supply of energy for a final desperate effort. Like a rocket blessed with the speed of light, he streaks under the arched span of the bridge as Jimmy's body, limp and formless now, reaches a point a few scant feet above the river. Hands extended and fingers spread wide, Superman exerts a last heartbreaking burst of incredible speed. His chest swims the scurling surface of the tide swept water as he arches his great body, forces his hands out almost beyond their normal reach, and catches the doomed boy a split second before he strikes the river. Got him. Now, up. It's all right, Jim. Uh, Everything's all right now. Uh, Poor Kitty passed out. Uh, uh, easy, boy. Uh, easy. But help, help. You don't need help anymore, Jim. Help Everything's me. all right. Uh, where, where am I? Flying over Metropolis. I'm dead. I'm going to heaven. Oh, no, no. Not quite yet, Jim. Then, then, I... Superman, it, it's you. Who else do you know who can fly without an airplane? I thought maybe you were an angel and... Leaps, you saved my life. They threw me off the bridge. Let's not talk about that now. We have work to do. What did you learn at the Guardian's headquarters, Jim? Evidently enough to force them to get rid of you. I, I learned everything. The head guy's name is Frank Hill. Frank Hill. He's got sort of dirty blonde hair and little pale blue eyes. And his fingers are long and thin and white like milk snakes. That's not a very pretty description. He's not a very pretty guy. Well, he'll be a lot less pretty when I get through with him. Are you going to grab him now? He's anywhere within reach. He wasn't at the penthouse apartment an hour ago. Gosh, were you there? Yes, there and a lot of other places looking for you. You had us all worried. Uh-oh, there's Willow Drive below us, Jim. Suppose we drop down and see whether Mr. Hill is at home and ready to receive visitors. Okay by me. Okay, hold on. Down we go. Go! <laughs> Quietly, Jim. Don't trip over anything. There are some potted plants on this terrace. I'm watching. Are you sure he's home? Yes. And so are the two characters who dropped you off the bridge. Where? Are they going to be surprised? Before that, they're going to be frightened. Frightened? Mm Mm-hmm. What do you mean? I'll show you. Easy now. You go through this door if it's unlocked. You could go through it locked. Too noisy. Good. It's open. Go ahead, Jim. Inside? Yes. Keep your voice down. Boy, sure is dark in here. They're close to me. Here, take my hand. Okay. Now where are we going? They're all in what I suppose is Hill's office next to the foyer. Has it got a black velvet curtain stretched across one end of the room? Yes. That's it. That's the curtain he stands behind when he talks to people. Watch it. I'm going to open another door to the hall. 
There's a light out there. I know. Come on. Hear their voices? Yeah. That door at the end of the hall, just before you get to the foyer, leads into Hill's office. So I see. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting about your x-ray vision. Wait a minute. Careful now. I don't want them to hear us. Better hold up. What are we going to do? Frighten them first and pounce on them later. Well, how can we frighten them? You can. They think you're dead floating down the river. People like that, narrow-minded, bigoted, hateful people, are usually superstitious. Ignorance and superstition go hand in hand. Anyone who believes as they do that men should be judged by the way they worship God is as ignorant as a jungle savage. You mean you want him to think I'm a ghost? That's the idea, Jim. I'll open the door and you just stand there. Blank-eyed. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Here goes. Flinging open the door to Frank Hill's office, Superman steps aside. And Jimmy advances to the threshold, arms dangling and eyes staring blankly into the room. We'll be back in a moment for the amazing and surprising climax to today's episode. So keep listening. Say, gang, have you tried it yet? Have you sampled that smooth combination? I mean, have you had a pep strawberry flip, this week's pep dish of the week? It's regular, gang, as terrific a breakfast dish as you'd ever want to taste. And it's made with a flip of the wrist. Sure, you just pour out your regular serving of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Put some fine, ripe strawberries on top. Then take your spoon, and now, look, very carefully, give the whole thing a neat flip so that the berries are scattered all through the toasty whole wheat flakes. Add milk and sugar, and there you are, a Pep strawberry flip. It's a dish that gives your appetite a lift because those crispy flakes of Kellogg's Pep are something to latch onto. They're so tender and golden and full of that keen sunshine flavor. Yes, sir, a dish of Kellogg's Pep adds up to mighty good eating. And Pep is good for you, too. So make it a point to eat every last spoonful in your bowl because this is no time to waste cereal. You see, the cereal grains have been picked out to give that swell grain nourishment to fellows and girls overseas. So when Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make it your job to guard against waste. If you pour your own Pep, pour it carefully and polish off every bit you pour out. Be sure to eat all your Pep. Don't waste it. Playing on what he is certain is their superstitious ignorance, Superman has decided to teach Frank Hill and his two henchmen the meaning of fear before turning them over to the police. Jimmy, who they believe is by now a corpse in the river, steps to the threshold of Hill's office as Superman opens the door and backs out of sight. For a long, ghastly moment, the three men in the room stare at the figure in the doorway, at its dangling arms and blank, seemingly sightless eyes. Then, as terror grips them, one of them, the man known as Carl, screams out. The ghost of that kid. Walk into the room, Jim. He's coming for us. Oh, he's coming. Keep him away. Stop it. Stop it, you fools. My gun. Where's my gun? Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Stay back. I've got the gun. I'll kill him. Over my dead body, Mr. Hill. Get behind me, Jimmy. Who? Who are you? I'll show you who I am in just a moment with my bare hands. Stay where you are. Don't come any closer. Put that gun down. I'll shoot. Put it down, I said. Carl. Eric, he's hit. Grab him. Not so fast. Let's go. Let's see what happens when I knock your thick heads together like this. Oh, good heavens. My, they sound hollow, don't they, Jim? Oh, Superman, are you all right? I'm fine, but these two specimens are out cold. Now, Mr. Hill, it's your turn. Stand back. You can't fool me. You are hit. Quite right. Two of the bullets struck me in the chest and the third in the stomach, but they bounced off. I heard you moan. I saw you stagger and grab for your stomach. Just a little act to draw off your two boyfriends. I was afraid if I went for you, they might go for Jimmy. Evidently, you don't know who I am. I don't care who you are. You're not leaving this room alive. Come again, Mr. Hill. And that, I believe, empties your gun. Yes, empty it is. Incredible. Impossible. Maybe you can figure it out while you're cooling your heels in jail. No, you're not going to get me in jail. You've got nothing on me. We've got everything on you, Hill. Everything, including the kitchen sink. Attempted murder, assault, arson, impairing the morals of minors, enough to send you behind bars for life. And on top of all that, we've got a little personal grudge to settle with you. We don't like people who push other people around. We don't like people who spread hatred and suspicion. I was only trying to protect America from foreigners. Go on. You know, America was founded by what you call foreigners. Right, Jim. Tell me, Hill, was it because you were trying to protect America that you told Muggs and his gang to set fire to Dave Hoffman's drugstore? Hoffman's a Jew. 
The Jews are trying to run the world. Hoffman's an American, regardless of his religious preference. Besides, as I recall, that was one of Herr Hitler's favorite lines. What about little Danny O'Neill? He's Catholic and comes of Irish parents. Yet you had him beaten within an inch of his life. That's a lie. I had nothing to do with it. Of course not. Rats like you get others to do their dirty work. What about Dr. Leeds, a good Protestant minister? You almost succeeded in killing him. Is he a foreigner? You forgot Rabbi Stone. Yes, born and brought up in America, an honor student at college. Is he a foreigner? I'm not talking. You don't have to talk, Hill. The things you've done and the things you've tried to do speak for themselves. Jim. Huh? Use that phone on the desk and call Inspector Henderson. Tell him to send a patrol wagon up for these fine specimens. Right, Superman. In the meantime, open that safe for me, Hill. Chances are it contains some interesting documents concerning your activities. I... I don't know the combination. That's a lie. Open it before I break you in two. I tell you I don't know the combination. Would you like me to rip the door off? You have no right to touch that. Is that... This is Jimmy Olsen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Hold it. Better let me talk to him, Jim. Uh, Just a minute, Inspector. Superman wants to talk to you. Thanks, Jim. Hello, Inspector. Oh, I'm fine, thanks. Jimmy and I are at the headquarters of that Guardians of America outfit. We've collared three of them, including the big shot. Superman, of Hill's trying to get away. Hold it, Inspector. No, you don't, Hill. Let go of me. I'll let go with this. There. Oh. you knocked him cold. Unfortunately, he'll live. Hello, Inspector. Sorry for the interruption. No, nothing important. Frank Hill, the leader of this rat's nest, decided he wanted to take a nap, and I had to rock him to sleep. <laughs> Yes, now they're all asleep. I suggest you get a patrol wagon over here as soon as you can. The number is 250 Willow Drive, the penthouse apartment. What's that? Oh, you did? Oh, well, fine. Yes, we'll be here. Right. So long. Well, Jim, he rounded up the gang at the pool room. He's got them all at headquarters. A mug, too? Uh Uh-huh. Now, suppose you and I take a look at that safe while we're waiting. Oh, how are you going to get it open? One guess. Oh, boy, I don't want to miss this. It isn't much of a safe. It's more like a sardine can. Well, here goes. That door should rip off its hinges pretty easily. Cheapers. You tore it open like a paper bag. And there's a lot more in it than you'll ever find in a paper bag. Look at those stacks of money. Must be a million dollars there. Not quite, but there's enough. Now, let's see what's in this brown manila envelope. This looks interesting. Mm. More money? No. No, it's papers of some kind. Anything interesting? I don't know yet. We'll find out in a minute. Here, hold the envelope, will you, Jim? Okay. Now, let's see what we have here. Mm-hmm. Great Scott. Well, what is it? Jim, we've stumbled on something amazing. Call Inspector Anderson back while I look through this stuff. Tell him to have all the kids in that pool room gang in his office. I want them all on hand when we bring Frank Hill in. I've got something to tell them and something to show them. What has Superman found in the manila envelope? We'll be back in a moment to find out and to learn a startling thing about Frank Hill. So keep listening. Say, gang, what's your favorite word for describing something that you think is pretty swell? Do you say neat? Keen, super terrific? Well, line up a whole bunch of those words, gang. You'll need them to describe this week's pep dish of the week. It's called a pep jamboree. And here's how it goes. You pour out your regular serving of Kellogg's Pep the Sunshine cereal and top it all over with mixed fruit cocktail and a little of the sweet syrup. Pour on milk and you have a pep jamboree. Colorful to look at, terrific to taste. Believe me, you'll have a jamboree with that dish. With those crunchy golden toasted flakes of Kellogg's Pep are so good, you can't miss. Before you know it, you'll polish off every tasty spoonful in your bowl. And uh, nothing could be smarter, especially nowadays, when we don't want to waste cereal. Because whole wheat is one of the cereal grains picked out to go to fellas and girls all over the world. So get hep to pep, gang. When Mom brings Kellogg's Pep home from the grocers, make sure it's not wasted. Handle with care is the idea if you pour your own cereal and eat up every bit you pour out. Just remember, eat all your pep. Don't waste it. Our scene is now Inspector Henderson's office at police headquarters. Crowded into the room are the ten boys who were members of the juvenile gang working for the Guardians of America. Frank Hill and his two henchmen recovered from the Superman sleep treatment. Henderson and three of his police captains, Jimmy Olsen and Superman himself. 
standing at one end of the room, holding some papers in his hand, Superman begins talking. Muggs, I want you to step forward. Since you were the leader of this gang, you can speak for all of them. Come on. All right. That man standing over there, Muggs, the man who calls himself Frank Hill, he was the one who gave you your orders, wasn't he? I don't know. You never saw him because he talked to you from behind a curtain, but you heard him speak. Now, you just heard his voice again. Do you recognize it? I don't know. All right. We'll tackle it another way. Have you any brothers, Muggs? Yeah, one. How old is your brother? Twenty-six. Was he in the Army during the war? No, in the Navy. Where is he now? He's in a hospital. He lost a leg. I see. Any of you other boys have brothers or fathers in the Army or Navy? Raise your hands if you did. You, you in the green shirt. My father got killed in the Army. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, the rest of you put your hands down. We've got enough. The only reason I asked you whether you had brothers or fathers fighting in the war was to prove something to you. These papers I'm holding in my hand were taken out of the safe in Frank Hill's office. One of them shows that Hill was a draft dodger. That while your brothers and fathers were being killed and wounded, he stayed behind and lived off the fat of the land. And you know what he was doing all during the war? He was a German spy. In fact, his name isn't even Frank Hill. His real name is Franz Hiller. And that's the man who told you he was trying to protect America. The man who organized the Guardians of America. The man who tried to stop decent Americans like Dave Hoffman and Dr. Leeds and Father Sheehan and Rabbi Stone from doing something for America. Franz Hiller, who tried to double-cross America while your brother Muggs was losing his leg fighting for America. That a dirty rat, I ought to kill him. You don't have to worry about him now. The America he told you he was guarding will take care of him and see to it that he does no more harm. But remember, remember this as long as you live. Whenever you meet up with anyone who is trying to cause trouble between people, anyone who tries to tell you that a man can't be a good American because he's a Catholic or a Jew or Protestant or whatever, you can be pretty sure he's a rotten American himself. Not only a rotten American, but a rotten human being. Don't ever forget that. Honest, Miss Lena, it would have done you a hard good to hear Superman tell those kids a thing or two. I thought they were going to tear that guy Hill or Hiller into a hundred pieces. And you know what? What, Jim? After they took Hiller out of Inspector Henderson's office, Muggs made a speech to the kids and told them that to make up for all they'd done, they had to go out and raise money to help build Unity House. How do you like that? Gee, that's fine, Jimmy. And I'm glad it's all over, but I really haven't time to listen anymore. I'm scheduled to make a speech at the opening rally for Henry Marshall tonight. Oh, he's the district attorney, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's running for mayor against Martin Higgins, and he's got to be elected, Jim. Higgins is a corrupt politician, supported by the gangster interest. Well, can I go along with you? Sure, all right. We better get going in a few minutes. We can stop off and have a bite somewhere. All right. Oh, excuse me, Jim. Sure. Lois Lane speaking. Miss Lane? Yes? I'm just calling to tell you that if you don't want to get hurt, you'll stay away from that Marshall rally tonight. What's that? You heard what I said. Stay away from that Marshall rally or you'll get hurt and hurt bad. An unidentified voice and a cryptic warning. Will Lois heed the warning, or will she attend the rally for Henry Marshall, the honest gang-busting candidate for mayor of Metropolis? <laughs> Fellows and girls, this is the beginning of a new Superman adventure, even more exciting than the one just concluded. So don't miss tomorrow's episode, when Lois and Jimmy find themselves involved with people who stop at nothing, not even murder. <laughs> Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. <laughs> And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Hey, how about being a pal to your dog like he is to you? Sure, do him a good turn. Treat him to Kellogg's Grow Pup Dog Food. Why, it beats all how many dogs give Grow Pup the glad eye. It's so full of meaty flavor. And there are three different kinds to pick from. There's Grow Pup Ribbon, Grow Pup Meal, and Grow Pup Pellets. 
And you can give your dog the kind he likes best because they all have what it takes to help keep him right on the beam. For lots of muscle, for strong bones and teeth, ask Mother to base your dog's diet on Kellogg's Grow Pup every day. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.